Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mike Little. I'm the mayor for the District of North Vancouver, and the pleasure falls to me to welcome everybody here to our regular meeting of council virtually for uh, Monday, January 11th at 7 o'clock. Uh, and uh, first off, we have a resolution to hold the public meeting without the public in attendance. This is one of the uh, by uh, one of the rules to make sure that we're um, properly recognizing that this is a virtual meeting. All of the text of the motion is in the agenda. Can I have a member of council moved. Moved, it. moved by Councilor Mary, second by Councilor Back. Call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Reminded. Motion carries. I guess I should probably just for the record uh, do a bit of a roll call. Uh, Councilor Mary, can you say that you're present? Here, present. Councilor Back. Present. Councillor Hansen. Present, thank you. Councillor Bond. I'm here. Councillor Forbes. Present. Councillor Curran. Here. We have a full uh, meeting with the entire council present for uh, this evening's meeting. Uh, next item that we have is council, there's been an agenda that's been circulated. Are there any errors or omissions from the agenda as presented? Hearing none, will someone move the agenda? So moved. As so moved. moved by Councillor Murray, second by Councillor Back. Call the question on the matter. All those in favor? Aye. Reminded. Motion carries. Uh, Council, we have a significant number of minutes that have been uh, proposed from staff. This is for the November 23rd special council meeting, December 7th regular, uh, November 17th public hearing, and December 8th public hearing. Are there any moved. air submissions from those minutes as presented? Hearing none, I heard moved by Council Murray. Is there a seconder on the matter? Second. Second. Back. Okay, call the question on the matter. All those in favor? Aye. Very minded. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Council. Okay, now we're going to move on to public input uh, and we reserve a period of time at the front end of each of our regular meetings of Council for uh, public input uh, and uh, instructions on how to get your name on that list are included with the agenda. Uh, and we have uh, two members of the public that have signed up to speak for this evening's meeting and uh, I'm gonna get to them uh, now, I just, uh, okay, good. I see that uh, both both of the people on the speakers list are present and participating. So, Mr. Peter Teven, you are the first person to speak followed by Taylor Slater. Uh, Mr. Teven, you have three minutes to address the council. Thank you, just wanna confirm you can hear me? Clearly. Great, and I'd like to share my screen and show you some graphics if I may. I think that's working. Uh, do you see, do you see uh, a PowerPoint? Yes, I do. Great, okay. Well, thank you very much, Your Worship and Council of Peter T. Van, 1900 Block Indian River Crescent. Um, bringing a new issue to your attention tonight, um, uh, as a matter of regular habit, uh, we uh, make use of the local uh, recycling facility down at the transfer station and it works very well. Um, so well that they managed to weed out three items that they weren't allowed to accept. And I'm not um, uh, coming before you to complain about that, uh, but more to ask help. These are the three items that I wasn't allowed to drop off. Uh, two of them, the wood conditioner, because those are not, uh, not received, they're not exactly paint. Uh, the other one, because we're not quite sure what it is because so much of the container was covered um, covered by stain, uh, uh, calling the company, it appears to be some sort of catalyst. Um, so upon advice from the staff there, I contacted Recycle BC and they gave me some very interesting advice. They said, if you live in one of the municipalities that has a household hazardous waste roundup day, then you can take it there. Otherwise, I don't know if I'm gonna tell you the advice that they gave me because you wouldn't like it. Um, suffice to say that they said that the charges, the fees and charges, the minimum charges to drop off a small quantity of such items were so onerous that they acknowledged that no household would do it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I asked the staff member and I've, I've sent this hard copy, you may have seen it already, I've sent this hard copy on to you uh, before the meeting tonight, Council, so you uh, perhaps can look into these other municipalities who do such a thing. Uh, the staff member at Recycle BC seemed to say that the uh, Langley systems were uh, very uh, effective uh, and that Maple Ridge were the most recent to implement theirs. 
Um, this is uh, what Langley has on their website. They call it a hazardous waste household quantity, of course, hazardous waste collection event. And of course, the, right on the web page is the goal is, is to make sure people don't pour them down the drain or onto the ground or in the storm sewer or put them in the garbage. Um, and, you know, one of the things we have to kind of acknowledge is that for what I had is maybe a liter and a half of material. Um, you know, if it's going to be 50 or a hundred dollars, it's almost like we're begging people to do these bad behaviors. Now, of course, I didn't do that, but that's what I want to submit to you is, is uh, perhaps to have one or two events a year. Um, you know, my thinking is, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be, I'm not asking to put it out of the curb. I think that would be too much mayhem. Um, I think that it should be at some sort of district facility and uh, people should have to show proof of residency. Uh, there should be limits. And, and then the district could pay the one dump fee to put it all out together. Um, you, one of the things that I want you to consider is I don't really see this as a, an economics question of kind of who pays because quite frankly, I don't think anybody would pay to drop off a liter and a half of, of wood condition. Um, you know, we're talking about probably 10 times. So I'm beyond my time. That's one I wanted to submit to you. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Teven. Uh, I'd love to have Mr. Joyce look into what programs the others are doing. I think that, that uh, I, I also would have a concern about having hazardous materials dropped off at the curb when, where you don't know what they are, but uh, perhaps we can look into it. Mr. Sp or Mr. Joyce, I see your hand. Uh, not my hand, your worship. I think it's probably still up from the last comment, but uh, we'll have Mr. Tvent's uh, presentation, and we absolutely will talk to Metro Vancouver and our North Shore partners. Thank you, Mr. Joyce, thank you, Mr. Tvent. Uh, my next speaker is Taylor Slater. Taylor, can you hear? Hi, me? my name's Taylor Slater. Hi, welcome. Um, I appreciate being given the time to speak at this meeting. After speaking with Mary Little recently, she informed me of this meeting so I could address the issue of drug addiction amongst youth in our community to our MLA Susie Chant. Currently, COVID is a major health crisis, but we need to remember that it's not our only health crisis, especially due to the pandemic, more people are struggling and turning to opioid use. In 2020, overdose deaths surpassed COVID-19 deaths. The stigma surrounding addiction is highly prevalent, but However, addiction can impact anyone, and our youth are specifically being impacted by our system's failures. We need long-term recovery programs for youth in our community that are accessible to all youth, where they can be taken away from any access to drugs. I have researched therapeutic schools in the US located in rural areas that offer long-term recovery programs with positive results. Given our land in BC, this is a potential solution. We also need to provide parents with more say. Currently, youth must voluntarily agree to go to short recovery programs, and I'm aware of the difficulty of getting addicted youth to agree to this after having spoken with many families who have been through the system. What we have currently is not working, and we need more than just band-aid approaches. My peer and I, Kaya, Kaya Perkins, are concerned about other youth in our community, which is why we will be creating a petition to send to our MLA, Susie Chant. We understand that this is not only an issue within our community, but a crisis nationwide. If anyone would like to contact us further about this issue or our petition, please email us at tastelater23 at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Taylor, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing to uh, bring more attention to this matter. All right, Council, uh, that's all the speakers I have for the public input period, and uh, we do have two delegations today, and uh, the first delegation that we're going to be uh, hearing is from our new MLA, Susie Chant, who's now the MLA for North Vancouver Seymour. Congratulations on your election. Uh, we thought it would be a great opportunity to uh, uh, to say hi, meet you, and maybe hear some of your priorities for the term. And your mute is on. There I am now unmuted. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to, uh, to join you in your meeting tonight. I really do appreciate it. And I'm very glad to uh, see and meet everybody. Uh, Jim, yes, hello. 
uh, and uh, everybody else. I, I may have crossed trails. I think Jordan, you and I have crossed trails once or twice uh, and maybe perhaps Matthew Bond as well, I think. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to be able to be here and uh, glad to be able to talk about some of the things that I'm hoping that I can uh, dovetail with you guys uh, around and we can uh, do some stuff. First of all, I really want to say thank you to Taylor. I don't know whether she's still listening or not, but thank you very much for uh, her commitment to bringing something forward that is, is critical uh, in our current community and uh, related to our youth is, is in a very um, tenuous place right now. Uh, I had the opportunity today actually to talk to the uh, BC Substance Use Council folks uh, at, to some great length and I'm also on the uh, committee for um, mental health addictions and homelessness uh, which is going to be looking at um, opioids uh, addiction and so on so uh, I'm her, her timing could not have been better her timing is exquisite um, and I'll have my uh, guy, my my folks reach out to her and maybe she and I can talk directly I would be I would be appreciative of that opportunity, Taylor, if you're listening. Um, so uh, I am, uh, as you know, new to this role. Uh, up until September of this year, I was functioning as a team leader in the uh, Vancouver Coastal Health uh, on the North Shore, uh, working with folks in the community to basically my team worked, uh, you know, about 140 people to keep about 3,500 people in various districts states of disrepair in their homes uh, and then the election came along rather abruptly and here I am. Um, so I'm learning the job, I'm learning the relationships, I'm looking forward to a very uh, functional relationship with the uh, District of North Vancouver. Uh, we're all I think on the same page wanting to do the best things that we can for the folks that live here and uh, do the best we can to both represent and advocate and also support. And that certainly is what my role is all about. I will be uh, moving into the office that Jane was in. So I'll be in uh, the, the complex in Lynn Valley by the library, which apparently you guys are my landlord. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually very, very pleased with the, uh, the bit that allows the province to pay the rent to the district. I think that's a, a, a totally appropriate way of doing business. Um, my, my priorities, I think, are very uh, similar to what you're looking at. Um, as I spoke to people throughout the campaign and as I've had the opportunity to speak with people since, housing comes up every time. Of course, everything is overlaid by COVID. Okay, and, and uh, our, our government, John Horgan, has been very, very clear that everything we do is, is focused around COVID with as, as the top layer of it, and then we work with everything else as well. And uh, certainly, um, you know, we were, the, we were the epicenter, I'm going to say, when we started. Uh, and we've been very fortunate that we've got some amazing people that are working on the North Shore. To, to manage uh, COVID and manage the things that are involved with it. Uh, and it's our own Dr. Ross Brown, who's ro rolling out the vaccinations, which is terrific. I was had the opportunity to speak with him uh, 10 days, no, just before Christmas, excuse me. Um, and so uh, he, is, he is doing a very good job of rolling out vaccinations, inclusive of the variability in the availability of them. Uh, anyway, so uh, key priorities are, of course, housing. Um, affordable housing is always a question. Uh, how, you know, people keep saying, well, traffic congestion is such a problem. How are we going to deal with traffic congestion? Okay, how are we going to make it so that not everybody has to drive in order to get through their jobs? Perhaps if we can get some of the folks, the nurses I'm working with, People are coming in from Maple Ridge, people are coming in from Bowen Island, people are coming in from Sunshine Coast, people are coming in from Squamish, because guess what? They're as nurses and a lot of them with partners who are also working full time, they can't afford to live on our shore. Uh, I have a 28 year old and a 23 year old. Um, nobody, neither of them is living in the district anymore. Uh, they're living where they can afford. Um, and I can't afford to support them to the point that they can live in the district independent of their mother. So we had an agreement. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, transportation, absolutely. And I, you know, I'll be working with Bowen Ma and supporting her in uh, the work that she's been doing up till now. And I will happily dovetail in with that and, and leap on that one. Uh, the environment, of course, we, we live in a jewel. I am so very grateful to have lived, worked and played in uh, this area for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, we need to, first of all, we need to be very careful with it. And second of all, we need to be um, aware of how to preserve and, and uh, what's the best word? I don't know what the best word is. Anyway, how to, how to make sure that when we interface with our environment that we uh, manage ourselves in such a way that we do not destroy the environment around it as has been done in many other places. Um, our OCP, we got lots of them going. Uh, we'll see how they go. I, uh, Lynn Valley is working hard. And uh, I also, uh, well, we've, we've already talked about the instep, um, which I will be working with, with Bowen. Oh, uh, anything else I should be thinking about? Oh, I uh, just want to comment just a little bit on, I, I will say I'm cheating because my uh, CA has left me some notes, which was very kind of him. Um, I, I was up wondering about uh, Argyle School this weekend, of course, when there weren't any kids there so that I couldn't uh, in, impinge on their safety. Uh, good to see. Uh, my, my kids both went to Argyle. The talk has been for many, many years that Argyle was going to be replaced. And lo and behold, look at that. It is and they are. And so the kids have started in school there and I'm very impressed. Um, I don't know if anybody is aware of the um, Municipal Poverty Reduction Grant. Uh, that came out a while, uh, last April, I think. And in fact, uh, North, Van uh, North Van District never actually applied for it. And I'm wondering about that and hoping that maybe we can talk about that because it is still available. Uh, and we've got, you know, we've got a poverty rate, my understanding is somewhere around 10% in our, in our area. And I would like to see if we could maybe get some funds to apply towards that. Uh, if I had the opportunity to talk, talk to somebody who's been involved with that, I would love it. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm very uh, focused on is getting in coordination with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Uh, you know, very, uh, you know, they are a, a very pertinent part of my constituency and I'm hoping that uh, I will have a good relationship and a good working relationship with them. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I'm hoping to just pilot in my office and look at in other places is uh, a, a concept that was brought forward to me by a parent of an adult with uh, special needs, and that is one of customized employment. So I'm going to be looking at uh, seeing what we can do within our office and see what we can do to encourage other businesses to start looking at uh, employment opportunities because one thing that COVID has done is it has uh, put a lens on the fact that many, many of our um, kids that have been special needs that have uh, transitioned to adults with special needs, the system that is in place to support them is when it's in place and COVID has taken away a lot of that um, is very much focused on recreational and not very much focus and support in the areas of vocational. And uh, there, that's something that is, is quite a big hole uh, in, in other parts of the province too, but is, is a hole here as well. And it's something that um, I'm hoping that we will be able to look at, uh, you know, and maybe set something up get it going and then move it out. Anyway, um, here I am. I am would love for the opportunity to talk with everybody in a maybe a less formal setting. Uh, perhaps Mayor Little, you and I have the opportunity. I have had the chance to talk with uh, Linda, B Linda Buchanan. Of course, the first half of the conversation was all nursey stuff. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm hoping that I'll have the opportunity to meet with people and talk with people and uh, Glad to be part of the crew. Well, thank That's you. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. There's so many areas where 
uh, where District of North Vancouver crosses over with provincial services. You highlighted a number with uh, transportation and housing. We also obviously, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, supporting persons with disabilities in our community and also relationships with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, Squamish Nation, and uh, all of the other governmental groups. We have a lot of crossovers. I look forward to working with you. There is actually an opportunity now for uh, just some friendly Q&A from members of council and greetings. Uh, I see Councillor Hansen has a hand up, so I'm gonna go to Councillor Hansen first. Be nice. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. And it's, it's so nice to be speaking to you in this uh, context, in this capacity, uh, MLA chant. And I'm really looking forward to what you're gonna be uh, contributing to our community. We're very excited. Uh, you intrigued us, intrigued me, and I'm sure intrigued the whole council with your comment. Uh, with respect to the municipal poverty reduction grant. I uh, wonder if you could just speak a little more about that, uh, give us more of an idea of what's involved and uh, perhaps um, uh, give us some direction as to the types of projects that you're envisioning uh, for that grant. Uh, Jim, at this point, I don't have that much detail with me. Uh, what I would like for the opportunity is to get that together and bring it to you. Um, I had not anticipated a lot of time this evening so I've, I've basically got um, sort of overviews on everything. And if, if I could bring that back to council, I would be appreciative of that, of that opportunity. I'd like That'd be to, all right. That, uh, we connect up Tina Atva from our uh, social planning department with uh, members of your staff to make sure we follow up on that grant. That would be great. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Hanson, any further comments? Okay, I'll go to Councillor. So, thank you. But very much welcome, uh, MLA Chan. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. I actually see Councillor Back's hand up. I'm going to go to Councillor Back. Thank you, Your Worship, and good evening, uh, MLA Chant. Welcome. Um, I look forward to getting to know you uh, in this role. Congratulations uh, on your on your win. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments and maybe a question. Um, one of the things I just with a nod to your predecessor, uh, Jane Thornthwaite, one of the things I loved about Jane was that she was always out there uh, in the community. Uh, this is, of course, pre COVID at every event and uh, always very accessible. Uh, if I ever had an issue was speaking to a resident and had an issue that related uh, to the province, I could always uh, look to Jane. So uh, I'm looking for that same sort of accessibility, hopefully uh, with you. And I, and I know um, I, I'm, I'm sure that'll be the case as we get to know each other. Um, you mentioned one of the major issues that came up uh, when you were at the door during the campaign was housing. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of how you how you address sort of what what some of the themes are that you heard from people around housing. Um, uh, and when you talk about housing, new development within the riding, um, kind of what, what what your thoughts are on, on development within the North and Seymour riding. Thank you, Councillor Back. I appreciate your uh, question. Uh, first off, one of the one of the big things that came up was um, concern about the current housing that is available to people with lower incomes. Uh, we had folks approaching us from various housing uh, establishments where you know maintenance has been a problem for a while, from uh, people that are living in properties that are. Um, uh, perhaps in, in going to be renovate, uh, uh, redeveloped in the next two years so that they're living there at perhaps a low rent, but there's absolutely no work being done on them. And uh, I was sp speaking to one family uh, where the, the husband has been long time disabled from, uh, through WorkSafe. His wife lost her employment through COVID and they are on their sixth move in four years uh, trying to find places that they could afford to live in. Uh, and they are, you know, they've been given notice that come uh, June, their their uh, home is going to be demolished and uh, another one put up. I've uh, also had people talking to me about uh, things such as the Whiteley Court Complex, where, you know, places have been uh, closed down and other things built, but not in the same market for people uh, looking for accommodation. Uh, additionally, uh, other places such as um, up by Princess Park, um, oh dear, can't remember, uh, Twin, Twin Lakes, uh, where they, you know, that's been affordable housing for a long time. And what's happening there is the places are being uh, renovated, but then the, the cost is going up, uh, etc. So there's, there's a lot of things that I'm hearing from folks uh, on the lower end of the income scale 
that they're finding, you know, many of them have grown up in North Van. They really want to be part of our community and continue to be part of our community and contributing members of our community. But it's, it's, uh, it's getting very, very difficult for them or many have already moved away. Uh, the other theme that I heard was uh, families such as myself um, who have youth, um, you know, under 30 year olds who um, are not able, you know, unless they're living with family, they cannot afford to live here. They're not making an income that is going to allow them to buy into the market, certainly uh, at market share. Uh, they're, they're not finding um, livable places uh, at a rent they can afford. Um, and that's, that's very difficult for people. And it's, it's very disheartening because they want to be able to uh, live in an environment that, that where they grew up and, and contribute back to where they grew up. Uh, and another group is our seniors. Uh, there are a whole bunch of people that are on fixed incomes that are living in places that uh, the, the, that doesn't matter. The rent goes up. You're living on a fixed income, so be it. And I happen to know that some of our subsidies for things have not gone up in a very long time. Uh, that that also is is problematic. Or if a senior wants to downgrade, uh, you know, and sell their home, sure. Are they going to find another place that they can live that is safe and accessible and workable uh, in the housing market that has so very little available? Uh, so these are see, these are some of the themes. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a challenge when you think about development. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, certainly a challenge when you say, okay, well, you know, look at, look at what we've been able to live in thus far. On the other hand, we need to, we, we really need to look at the people of our community and see if we can make things accessible to them. Uh, and, and allow the folks that support our community, the nurses, the doctor, the nurses, the police, the, uh, the firefighters who live off the shore because they can't afford to live here but they come and they support our community the and and so you know common themes all around housing each one of them could be parsed apart and come up with its own little project but uh and then you know then we've got we too have homelessness as you, i mean i'm talking to the choir here um and so that too needs to be looked at and we need to get in front of it we're, we're not in the state that some other communities are in right now. That doesn't mean that can't change. And we do have an awful lot of people that live in our bush. There is no question about that. Uh, and uh, that, you know, that, that has implications as well. There are things that we should, could, would do if we can. Does that speak to your question? Uh, yes, there's lots to cover there. And I'm sorry to kind of put you on the spot. So I, I appreciate no, no, it. No. I hear I hear the passion in your voice on it. So I, I really look forward to uh, chatting with you one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and some Absolutely. potential ideas. Absolutely, I look forward to it. I should mention that my wife is a nurse as well. So I have that connection. Spectacular. Do I know her? Where does she I work? I don't think so. Uh, Lionsgate. So I might know her. Uh, so it was possible. Possibly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I believe Councillor Curran was next. Hi there. Um, I prefer to be called Megan. Um, are you okay with Susie, Susie? I am. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm actually um, much, I, I couldn't figure out why everybody was calling me Emily. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> took me a little while. I'm you always know? the same. I'm like, who is Councillor Curran? What are yeah, you talking exactly. about? Exactly. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, nice to meet you. Um, I have reached out a few times. We haven't been able to connect. So hopefully now we will be able to. Um, I truly hope so. Yes. I look forward to that. Congratulations. Um, and I think we, we have a lot of uh, same, the same um, issues. Well, we have all of the same probably um, sure issues to contend with. So um, I, when people knew you were speaking and I was here, they're like, these are the things that were important to them. So I just want to um, bring these up. And then of course, I don't expect that we're going to have an extensive conversation now, but just to, to follow up, I, we declared a climate and ecological emergency in July of 2019, and we are fully committed to achieving um, the IPCC and the IPBES targets. Um, one of those uh, steps was the rodenticide um, ban on the ecological side, and I know uh, several folks in our community have reached out to you, and I just wanted to say that they've really appreciated um, you being there to talk to them about that. That's been something that 
we led in the district. And I think that shows that this collective action works. We led on a municipal basis. And now I think we're up to maybe nine municipalities that have taken that step. So um, look forward to, that's a small, a small thing that we can do, but I think a big difference. So Baby thank steps. you. Um, everyone has, has said that it's been a pleasure to work with you on that. Um, and then childcare um, didn't come up specifically, yes. but it's certainly something that is top of mind, especially in our Seymour, I live in Deep Cove. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I think childcare is something we need to um, work on. I'm excited to see the federal and provincial government step into that space in terms of funding after many decades of not funding it. Uh, the District of North Vancouver jo um, joined the Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities to really address uh, systemic racism, um, exclusion um, in our community. And so that's something that I know there's lots of folks in our community that are very passionate about and would love to have the opportunity to, I know the provincial government has also made that a priority, uh, working of course, as you mentioned with Slay with Squamish Nation, um, as well as racialized black indigenous folks um, in our community to ensure that we're addressing um, systemic issues that are um, causing ha ongoing harm. And then climate justice is my number one. Um, so people are, you know, I'm here to advocate for a ban on um, any subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. And that's something that people are asking for. So I'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you about that. Um, we've mapped out clean BC and we're not, we have no chance of getting there with the current actions. So I think that's really important that we connect on that. So if you could set aside like a week. Sure, um, <laughs> and, and I'll get, by the way, I'll have everything done by, Next Wednesday. No yeah. Um, and right? BC, the last one, I'm, there's a million, but the BC housing um, really working on, uh, we have, I think, really stepped up passionately about to try to um, take some action on addressing people who are experiencing homelessness in our community. And there's been some delays that I think we could work through, as well as procurement uh, policies for making sure that we're building the right housing um, to be resilient uh, in the face of our um global heating. So thank you. Nice to meet you. And um, is it just email? What's the best way to try to set something up? Um, email is fine. Uh, and I will see if I can put it in the chat. How's that? Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I haven't been successful so far. So I'm hoping this is this is the time. Really? No, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm, I'm uh, at some point when we do get together, I'd like to hear what happened because I, no, I think that's those fair. I, I do. I, I believe you have a very significant workload, but I do look forward to connecting. So welcome and thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, MLA Chant, and congratulations <laughs> on your new role. And I look forward to working with you. I'm going to be very brief. I'll just plant the seed that the um, my interests, among all of the other issues that have been raised by council, um, but one significant one that I think drives a lot is uh, assessment and uh, the concept of highest and best use um, within the provincial government. Um, it's been a, an issue that... Uh, the NDP is, uh, has been looking at since they became um, in power, and uh, it was one that the Liberals um, uh, certainly implemented, and it's, uh, it's driving the value of land, which is um, the, uh, the, the significant drive to the cost of the developments that we're seeing. And so I will just plant that seed, highest and best use, and then I look forward to an opportunity to chat with you on the telephone or when we're allowed to uh, chat with you in person. And again, congratulations, and uh, I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Come have tea once we can. Yeah. <laughs> tea at my place. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think Councillor Forbes, you had your hand up and lowered your hand or would any other member of council like to make a comment? Councillor Forbes. There we go. Hello, MLA, Susie Chant. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah. I think we had a mutual friend helping us on both our campaigns, which I can talk to you about when I see you maybe. But anyway, congratulations. And um, I'm about a 10 minute walk, if that, from your office. So I'll come up and visit with you at your office and I won't take up any more time tonight, but just welcome, thank you. And I look forward to working with you. 
spectacular. I'm hoping my office will be open for March. I was hoping for February, but apparently I have rosy colored glasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Any other members of council wishing to make a comment? Okay. So, uh, Emily Chan, uh, you have a, a, a rather unique situation in that even, even though you only officially represent uh, a little more than half of the District of North Vancouver, you actually represent every member of council. Uh, every member of the District of North Vancouver Council lives within your ride, which is unusual. It doesn't normally happen. Spectacular. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so anytime we can be of service or, um, uh, you know, help, help you with a project, uh, let us know. I see us having a lot of projects where there's crossover between the district and the provincial government particularly as we address our housing issues in our community and our transportation issues. So uh, look and forward of, to And of course I reciprocate, uh, you know, I absolutely, that it, it's critical that we be able to work together. Well, I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much for making yourself available for an introduction today. Of course. Thank you. Move for seat of the delegation. Is there a seconder on that motion? Second. Second, so it's moved and seconded. I'm going to bail out now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries and the delegation is received. Our next delegation up this evening is the uh, North Shore Youth Young Citizens Council. And I believe I have uh, uh, Rowan uh, Gentleman Sylvester is the person who signed up, but uh, you may have other members of your group present. It'd be great if you could introduce yourself and introduce uh, the people you've brought to the meeting today. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Your Worship. Uh, the group members will introduce themselves. I'll just pass it over to Lewis. Do you have an order or do you want to direct an order? How about that? I, sorry, just want to check my mic. Is my mic all good? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, apologize for the lighting here. Alrighty, so we'll just get straight into it. Hello, counselors. Hello, Your Worship. My name is Lewis, and I'm presenting on behalf of the District of North Van Project Team for the 2020 cohort of the North Shore Young Citizens Forum. Welcome. Thank you. For our presentation, I'll be going over who we are as a team and as part of the missing middle, why we chose housing as our topic. We'll take a look at the missing middle housing and finally, we'll go over a few recommendations that we suggest that the district should look into. Before I start, I'll invite my fellow teammate, Andrea, to share a land acknowledgement with you. Hi there, can everybody hear me? Yes. We are here today on the traditional ancestral stolen and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Colonial policies such as the Indian Act still enforced today have been used by settlers to separate Indigenous peoples from their lands. Indigenous peoples are here and fighting oppression each and every day. As we reimagine housing, we need to work with young Indigenous people and reckon with who has gained, settlers have gained intergenerational equity in land, and who has been and is being harmed, Indigenous families being dispossessed for generations. Back to you, Lewis. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we're a group of engaged young adults living, working, and playing on the North Shore, all of the shared goal of being more civically engaged. Our specific team consists of folks that live here in the District of North Van, and we met online every week since the start of October 2020 with the task of developing a project with a topic that is important to us. We are part of the missing middle, and we are a very important group of people. We make up 31% of the population in the district, we're in the age group that is most likely to start our own business. We are recipients of institutional knowledge and we're in the age group that is most likely to make charitable donations. We used a survey to collect stories from young people connected to the North Shore to better understand housing accessibility challenges. We chose housing because it's a basic need for everyone. Housing policy is heavily influenced by municipal governments. And we also recognize that young people are disproportionately impacted by our current housing policies. One key problem that we've identified that hurts young people's housing accessibility is the missing middle housing, examples of which are featured here on the slide. We believe that the OCP is going in the right direction in terms of encouraging diversity in housing types, tenures, and affordability. We know that the OCP is also up for review in the spring of 2021, which further incentivized us to create a survey aiming to collect housing stories from young people in the North Shore. 
We also thought of ways to engage young people in urban matters during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So we created an online survey that asked questions like what your current housing situation is or what your future housing plans are. Our main priority was to collect and share unique housing stories from young people. We do recognize that there are limitations to our survey. It's only accessible online. So we are aware of individuals who may not own the technology necessary to access it. We are also aware that we didn't get enough responses from our pilot survey to comfortably represent the missing middle demographic. However, we do believe that this survey can be used as an engagement tool that can be further scaled up by the District of North Vancouver. We compiled a list of potential stakeholders to consult with here. With that being said, we have collected 23 responses so far. We picked a few responses to share with you today. These stories provide us a better understanding of what housing actually means to young people on the North Shore. We know that housing is not always about price, although it's arguably one of the main reasons for people to move out of the North Shore. Simply put, it's not easy to just move away. We can see that people are attached to their houses and their surroundings. Having access to the greenery and the oceans is one of the North Shore's key defining characteristics. We know that housing becomes more than just what you live in, but also what's close by, what commuting options are available, and being able to stay connected with our local communities. In essence, this is what we can call home. For the final part of our project, we came up with three possibilities for solutions in regards to housing. These solutions build off of the work done by the 2019 Forum cohort as well. We hope that the OCP review will increase the consultation of young people. We would like to see a scaled up version of our survey being distributed and funded by the district. And we believe that there should be more intergenerational dialogue. We think this may address the gaps in what is typically assumed and possibly find some common ground regarding housing needs between the generations. Before I conclude, I'd like to introduce to you the rest of the DNV project team. Our team has worked pretty hard to complete this project and I'd like to thank them all for their hard work. And I'd like to thank you for listening. My name is Lewis and it's been an absolute pleasure presenting tonight and we welcome any questions or feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, yeah, there's definitely uh, no question. There's lots of places where we have crossovers and I think you've identified the OCP as an opportunity to better integrate uh, uh, young perspectives into uh, housing planning moving forward. I think that's uh, critically important. Uh, the other one is transportation. What we find all the time uh, when I uh, go and meet with the Capilano Student Union is that uh, uh, mobility across the North Shore and off the North Shore is a big challenge, particularly to young people who may have uh, uh, may not have access to a car, may have chosen to not use a car, uh, but uh, the ability to rely on public transit in our community is also a big impediment uh, to uh, young people on the North Shore. Uh, so it would be a, a great opportunity to get more feedback on those kinds of matters. Uh, Councillor Murray, you have your hand up. Um, thank you. I'll move receipt of the delegation to start. Move. Is there a second on receipt of the delegation? Second. Second by Councillor Back. Councillor Murray, go ahead. Uh, Councillor Back and I are tag team tonight on moving and seconding. <laughs> Just click on the button. It's efficient, isn't it? Um, thank you very much, all of you, um, for presenting and for all of you taking part um, in uh, this project and bringing this presentation to council. Um, you made a comment in regards to uh, the OCB being review commencing this spring. Um, and we are partway through that review. So I, I was just wondering, I'm always really concerned about the level of communication. And I'm glad that you pointed out that, you know, there were some challenges, even for um, those of you within that demographic that are probably the most technologically advanced out of the rest of us. Um, but there are even some constraints in regards to uh, younger people being ha having the technology or access to equipment to be able to, um, for instance, go and take part in your survey. Um, so we are part way through that review and I'm just wondering if you could clarify if that was your understanding or you believe that we would be starting that review this spring. I'm, not I'm, sure. hap I'm happy to speak to that. Can Thank, you. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Councillors uh, Beck and Bond. Uh, very kindly attended one of the North Shore Young Citizens Forum sessions. There are 10 sessions in total, and I forget 
the specific session that they attended, but they gave feedback on our interim project at that time and let us know that uh, review that had been planned for the OCP got delayed because of COVID so that there, it would be happening in winter 2021. So um, I don't think it was clear if the review had started in last year and was continuing to this year or not. We just knew there would be some review coming well, up. Okay. Yeah. So we did, we did start it and then COVID okay. came along and kind of bumped us out of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll be continuing on, but certainly um, one of the challenges with it is it has been hard to attract the younger part of your demographic. Um, mm -hmm. Students, for instance, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, people coming out of high school, going into post-secondary, that has been a challenge. And so certainly um, I'm glad that's on your radar and uh, hopefully there'll be um, opportunities for you to further contribute to, um, you know, issues that, um, you know, are a concern to yourselves. And, uh, and hopefully there'll be an opportunity for you to bring those uh, comments forward throughout the second half of that review um, to completion, who knows when, based on, uh, based on the world that we're living in right now. Um, it's challenging. Yes, yep. it is challenging. Um, but thank you very much. Thanks for that clarification and uh, appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Councillor Murray. I believe the next is Councillor Hansen. Thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, presentation on this very important topic and your engagement uh, with us and with the community on this uh, very important topic. My spouse and I have a 22 year old daughter and a 24 year old son. And uh, so this whole issue of housing and housing affordability and um, the, the ability to stay on the North Shore and be part of this uh, community where I've grown up and where I lived with my uh, grandparents and they lived with, uh, grew up among their grandparents. And of course, it's, uh, uh, it, it breaks our heart to think that uh, it, it's not gonna be possible for our children to stay uh, potentially in this community. And I wonder if you could assist and give a little information uh, to us with respect to your perspective on affordability. Um, you know, so often these uh, developments come forward and we're told, oh, this is going to uh, uh, address um, housing affordability, but often the, the amounts of money involved to secure the housing that's uh, being brought forward. I know it's completely out of the reach of, of my 22-year-old and my 24-year-old um, who work in uh, jobs that uh, earn perhaps um, 14, 16, 18 dollars an hour. Uh, sometimes full-time and uh, sometimes less than full-time. But uh, in terms of this missing middle, uh, in terms of housing that actually is affordable to the cohort that you represent, can you give us some figures, some monthly, what, what a monthly uh, uh, rent is or a monthly uh, target, something that we can consider as we, uh, we look at housing proposals that come forward? Uh, what, what would actually, uh, from your perspective, uh, address the real needs of uh, this uh, of, of your cohort and allow you to stay in the North Shore, given uh, the employment dynamic that's out there and given what's actually uh, available in terms of income to young people. Uh, is that directed at someone specific or do you have someone on the council that uh, can best address housing? Yeah, I've been directing that to any, any, anyone who uh, might uh, be able to offer some insight there because I think that could be useful to us. Um, yeah, I, I can speak to that as best as I could. Um, I mean, when it comes to affordability, I think it's it's pretty difficult to define what affordability is. It depends on who's defining it, of course. Um, in terms of um, insight that we have, again, we only were able to do a pilot survey with our survey. We weren't really able to um, really have enough statistics to back up and comfortably represent this missing middle demographic. Um, from the information that we have now, which we piloted with the cohort that we have now, as well as some cohort members of the 2019 cohort. And uh, I'm just pulling up that information here, just one second. I don't have um, rent numbers, rather I have um, uh, what their household pre-tax annual income is. And um, 
40% of people of the 23 responses we had makes around 80,000 to 200,000. Meanwhile, we have 27% of people making 200,000 or more, and then 13% people making 18,000 or less. Okay. I hope that answers that question, Councillor Hansen. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have Councillor Curran. Thank you. Um, I like Megan, so hi everyone. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'd hoped to make it. I had something like super that I couldn't change. Otherwise I would have come to the meeting you invited us to. So thanks for that. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you for your thoughtful land acknowledgement. I thought um, I'm really inspired by um, how much further along young people are than I was when I was um, your age. And so I'm really thankful for that. I learn from young folks every day. Um, I, I wondered about um, what your, in your lives here on the North Shore, what your parents and potentially grandparents, um, what are some of the challenges that you face with this um, sort of transformation um, truly that we need to go through as a society? Um, what conversations do you have? Do you have any insights? Um, because I think a lot of it is just really coming together. Um, we know where we need to go. Um, we know how to get there. Um, but there are sometimes um, challenges in the way. So I, I just wondered that firsthand experience that you have. I have the privilege of working with young folks um, in climate justice space. And so we work together and I'm like, hey, where are your parents and grandparents um, in all of this? Um, because we really all have to come together. So always looking for ways to do that. So if anyone has any um, insight into that, I think uh, that would really be um, helpful. And I really appreciated the idea of this intergenerational uh, conversation, because this is something that um, when we get to the other side is going to be so much better for everyone um, when our health and our wellness, mental health and physical health is the priority. Um, and addressing some of the systemic equity issues. So does anyone wanna to speak to that? Um, what you experience with your own, in your own own lives and- Sure, Megan, I, yeah. I'd love um, to hear that, thanks. I'd be happy to speak to that. Uh, my name's Andrea. Um, to give you a little background, I'm a white colonial settler with lots of privilege. <laughs> white privilege, um, race, class, um, I'm also a person living with invisible disabilities, so that necessarily affects my lens and how I move through the world. Um, I moved to the North Shore, also Deep Cove Seymour area during the pandemic. And I just happen to be lucky that uh, my partner has a place, um, but it's small and we'd like to have other options. Some of the mixed use options on that slide, whether that's co-housing or co-op, or uh, rent to own greater density, having commercial on the bottom floor and residential on top. We heard from people at the community session that some of the new developments that are being built aren't uh, incorporating features that people need. So parking spaces that are large enough for their work trucks or in their particular buildings, uh, elevators don't allow bikes or strollers. So it's not welcoming to um, people within the community. We, I think I would check with Rowan and Andrea and they can speak to this, but we'd be happy to share the stories we have collected to date. And we pulled the seven team member that we, seven team members that worked on this DNV survey project. And there are a couple of us that would be interested in continu continuing to work with mayor and counselor either to scale up this survey, survey or in another capacity. Um, we did get a lot of interest from people who, who completed the survey. They took a lot of time to share stories and about 40% of the respondents were keen to become uh, more involved in municipal politics. So hopefully that shares some of my story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Megan. Here you go. <laughs> just back. Megan why is it so hard <laughs> I don't the only the only thing is I I normally would the only thing is I don't want somebody who's watching it to think that I'm not paying you the same respect and regard I'm paying to other people <laughs> so that's the only thing I'm being cautious about uh, but if you want to can I move a motion that we all go by our first names <laughs> <laughs> counselor back 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I am very supportive of uh, this initiative and I have since uh, since this started in 2019. Um, Councillor, sorry, I'm having an issue with my mic. Um, Councillor Bond and I did attend your session in November and uh, I, I do apologize if we led you astray with regards to the OCP review and where we were at with that. But I know our staff have been working closely with uh, with you and have been very supportive of, of involving you in the OCP review, um, which I'm very much uh, supportive of as well. Um, I wanted to uh, comment on a couple of things. I'm also interested in, in reading more of the stories that you collected uh, in the survey. I think that would really help us give some perspective on housing as it relates to um, to people that are living it in, in the younger demographics. Um, and um, as we go forward, you mentioned that you would be interested, or a couple of you would be interested in staying involved. Um, I'd be interested in hearing how you think that could look. Um, you know, I, I noticed you're calling it the North Shore Young Citizens Council now, and I really like the, like the idea of forming a Young Citizens Council, um, be it just for the district or maybe across the North Shore, where we can actually work with you on an ongoing basis and actually give you um, projects and initiatives that, that we can be running through, through the council. Um, that's an idea that I've kind of had for a while in the back of my mind, and um, maybe there's some way like that that we can we can create an, an ongoing uh, forum to hear from younger citizens. Because I think um, it's great to have these, you know, updates from from your group. Um, but I, I would love to have sort of a more regular check in. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for all the work to date, and um, yeah, it's really appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Back, Councillor Bond. Thank you, Mayor Dolan. I'd like to thank uh, all the members of the Young Citizens Council for all the work and the time and the effort that you've put into this initiative. Uh, like Councillor Back, I was very excited to attend the event um, back uh, when that was, um, in the before times, not quite, but, um, and uh, a very supportive of the ongoing work um, that you're doing. I think one of the most, one of the best things about initiatives like this are the level of involvement and the level of experience and education that, you know, quote unquote, ordinary citizens uh, in the district uh, come to have about district processes and what decisions council and municipal government make and the importance of municipal government on uh, everyday lives. So uh, I'm very interested in uh, perhaps getting some comments from staff on how uh, council can support uh, not just those three topic areas that you've presented as potential actions moving forward. Uh, I, I really like the idea of expanding the survey as part of the OCP review and getting more of those stories. The, I think in a lot of planning documents and a lot of the decisions that we make, we hear a lot about numbers and theory and plans, but really it is really about the stories that help uh, guide our community and our decision making and, and hearing those stories from people's lived experience and the struggles that they're having, whether they're a, a low income person in our community, whether they're a, a young citizen, which I think Councillor Back and I both still qualify as according to your uh, definition. Um, but it's really important as we make long term decisions uh, for in specifically around land use, which is our most important tool that we have as local government uh, that we look at the long-term impacts and have those uh, those voices and those perspectives of people that would like to be here uh, for the long term. And so I'm very supportive of that. And I'd be very um, interested also uh, uh, to get a staff comment from, on Councillor Back's uh, idea of having a more formalized um, route. I know we have a number of committees. I'm not sure if this kind of goes to a um, uh, an AOC type thing where we're establishing new committees. I know there's some work ongoing uh, on that in terms of our committee structure, but uh, I'd like to hear uh, some staff comments on moving some of these ideas forward. I'm gonna to go to Mr. Milburn. I don't have Ms. Atba here. Uh, Mr. Milburn, uh, ways to incorporate uh, young perspectives into the remaining process of the uh, OCP, but also uh, uh, what kind of uh, ad hoc or standing committee on youth issues. Uh, could be contemplated. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, so council has given uh, staff some direction and we are collecting input from a variety of different sources uh, to provide council with, um, you know, a full spectrum of, of 
thoughts and comments from the community leading into the OCP targeted review and action planning uh, to occur later this summer and this fall. And uh, certainly we've you know, been given lots of food for thought tonight and we intend to be reaching out to this, this group and, and possibly even connecting them with the um, a rental, social, and affordable housing task force, which is a, a, a group that represents a variety of community members um, and is providing council with um, some key advice on, on housing challenges in the community. So I'd like to make that connection as well. And um, in terms of um, a, a committee of council, I think a referral to the, um, uh, the, the committee responsible for uh, committee formation and, and committee changes might, might be appropriate. Um, it's the advisory oversight committee and uh, would certainly be able to uh, work with the clerk on, on the agenda for that uh, particular committee's uh, efforts. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I think this is a really critical area. I think we've hit on uh, a challenge that we do have in terms of obtaining input from all different cohorts, all different ages and all different people within our community, which is so critical to making a plan that's uh, successful. Uh, for the community going forward. So we really do appreciate the delegation coming out tonight, um, offering uh, to contribute, and we'll, we'll certainly be reaching out with them following tonight. Mr. Milburn, any further comment, Councillor Bowen? Uh, no other ones other than when uh, someone offers, especially a citizen or an engaged citizen offers to come out and provide their input and provide their expertise and do work on behalf of the community and they're here right now uh, in front of us, I think it's uh, our best interest and the community's best interest to take advantage of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I see no further speakers. It wasn't so long ago that I was considered a young citizen in this community. I think I was 29 when I came on council. Uh, and uh, uh, But now I, I had the realization during the Christmas break that I have a 19 year old in my house. And so it's uh, uh, time slips away quickly. Uh, but I hope you hear that, uh, that this council is uh, very concerned about the issues facing young people in the community. Our top priorities since the last election have been related to transportation and housing in this community, including building the kind of housing that offers uh, affordable housing options and mixed uh, types of ownership as well, which we think should make it more accessible to people. But we have that constant press of, of demand uh, when we had an earlier presentation tonight that uh, talked about how people were living uh, all the way out uh, in commuting from, from Abbotsford to come and work in the North Shore. And the difficult realization there is that means that not just Abbotsford, not Abbotsford may be affordable to them, but that means that Langley's not, Surrey's not, Coquitlam's not, New West is not, Burnaby's not, Vancouver's not, and then the North Shore. And so our ability to cross that gap without assistance from the provincial government is, is very tricky. We would have to build uh, a tremendous amount on the North Shore and, 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 uh, and it wouldn't be affordable for years and years and years to come. And so those are the challenges we face, but I, I do hope you see from the, the, the work that the council has put forward for development that we have been very focused on having a very high percentage of our units have affordable housing components to them and uh, try to make them more accessible. Councillor Kern, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly um, mention that something I've learned recently is that even the, the word citizen is can be exclusive for people who are either permanent residents or here on um, temporary status. So um, just something to throw out there, as I heard it time and time again, it's been brought up to me. I did the same thing, so I'm not at all. Um, I'm just saying it's something that I've learned um, as well, just to try to be more inclusive in our language. So um, just sharing that knowledge that was shared with me. So that's it. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Megan. <laughs> thank you, That's Megan. Funny. Sorry, Megan. thank you, Megan. <laughs> thank you so much for your presentation here. I have, uh, the delegation has been moved uh, by Council Gary, seconded by Council Back. I see no further speakers from Council. So I'm gonna call the question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you so much for your presentation and making yourself available today. We do appreciate it. Okay, moving on to reports from council or staff. Uh, council, we have six items on the agenda and then uh, reports. Uh, I, I'm not gonna be proposing a consent agenda because I think that uh, many of these things, even though some of them are, are brief, just uh, um, they're uh, just notifying what's taking place that uh, I think we'll be able to move through the rest of the agenda uh, without a consent agenda. Uh, and so I'm going to move on to uh, 
item 8.1, which is the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Structural Flood Mitigation 2020 Application for Debris Hazard Management on Panorama Drive at Matthews Brook and Gables Creek. And uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Joyce for any comment. Uh, Your Worship, uh, it's one of the grant applications that we put in for. Um, this is a continuation of the work that BGC did, if Council recalls, several years ago. We've been working through these projects systematically. Uh, as I say, this one is on Panora Panorama Drive at Gavels Creek and Matthews Brook uh, for some creek channel improvements. We're looking through the UBC. I'm looking at a total of 750000 for the grant of a $1.3 million project that we've currently got in the five-year financial plan. So like a lot with these, you know, the same as the other two grants that are coming up behind this one, uh, we're looking for council support at this time. Um, and then we'll work through the design process and consultation with the neighborhood should we be successful in the grant. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bridger was on earlier. Mr. Bridger, do you have further comments with your report? Uh, still here, Your Worship. Uh, no further comment other than uh, what Gavin had just mentioned. Uh, the, otherwise, I guess the grant application has been submitted. We're looking for uh, the council resolution at this point to, to complete that process. Okay. I uh, moved by Councillor Murray, seconded by, I believe it was Councillor Back. Uh, Councillor Murray, any further comments on the matter? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Councillor Back, any further comments on the matter? No, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Curran, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I support this. I just wondered if staff, and it's enough to be now, but could give us an update on, um, I know we have 35 creeks that we're looking at. Um, so I think uh, the community might be interested in the, the cost um, of some of the adaptation that we need to do um, with all of the creeks. And, um, and then also uh, where we are in terms of that creek hazard, um, we identified um, different places and they were given priority status and maybe just an update on that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, I see no further speakers. So I'll call the question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Okay, moving on to item 8.2. Councillor Curran, did you have a comment about 8.2? Um, yeah, just that I'm recused from um, this because I have a business in the Cove. And so I think um, item 8.2 and 8.3 are related to the same matter. So I will be zoomed away somewhere is how I understand it. Um, and then I'll be brought back. Is that happening? <laughs> is someone moving me somewhere? Uh, uh, can we have the clerk? Thank you very much. So Councillor Curran is the waiting room for the next two items and then we'll welcome her back at that point. Uh, first item 8.2, uh, grant funding application livable Beco COVID resilience project. Uh, and uh, do we have any staff comments on the matter? Uh, I'll start your worship and Ms. Boxen I believe is on the line as well. Um, this is a resilience project uh, with a shared street that council is aware of uh, in the lower Gallant area that received uh, a very favorable support from the community, uh, both residences and businesses alike. Uh, so we're making application for this grant. Um, I will make the point right now that this is an entirely separate project from the next one council is considering. These two projects are not linked, uh, but we are making an application for this under the, what we're calling the Livable Deep Grove Resiliency through the Canada Infrastructure Program. And uh, we require a council uh, recommendation so we can make application for that grant. I don't know if Ms. Moxon may also may have a comment at this point. Ms. Moxon? Oh, hello, Your Worship and Council. I'm, at this point, no, I don't have any um, comments. I'm really just here in case there are any questions that come up from Council. Thank you very much. Council, I don't see a hand. Will somebody be moving a recommendation? I'll move. Moved by Councillor Murray. Is there a seconder for the recommendation? And sorry, you're moving the staff recommendation, I'm assuming? Yeah. Is there a seconder for the staff recommendation? I'll second that recommendation. Oh. Councillor Muir, any further comments on the matter? Well, I just wanted to bring forward sort of um, where I feel like we're at in regards to support um, and maybe some concerns that have been shared with me um, in regards to this project. Um, I, I think there is a lot of support for um, building a plaza 
um, on lower Gallant. Um, but I'm not sure that there is the same kind of support to um, create a permanent new access into the cove um, down Naughton. And I understand the um, complexities of this project um, and the challenges in trying to replace a pipe that is underneath the upper half of Gallant um, in a you know relatively reasonable amount of time. And I'm still not exactly sure with the written material that we've had to date and conversations, what that amount of time actually is. Um, this report suggests that the work will be taking place in the summer. I was under the understanding that this work would be starting shortly, um, March, and it would go, um, you know, uh, you know, eight months in. Um, and that's if everything worked perfectly. Um, the uh, rerouting of the traffic and certainly the challenges of running, um, you know, large semis for all intents and purposes, um, servicing the local businesses and buses um, down Cliffmont certainly has its challenges. And um, the connection on Naughton seemed like, although a, a, a um, you know, certainly a significant impact to those that sit directly off of that area um, looked like really the most reasonable um, solution given the challenges of flagging a street um, in the evenings for buses, if, if that's indeed what we would have to do. Um, I think the renderings in the report sort of are indicative of some of the concerns that the residents have that they feel they haven't really been able to give any comment. And I think that's because there's two issues. There's the work that we have to do in regards to the pipe. And then there's the issues of sort of the long term, which is what this application is about, um, redesign of that lower part of Gallant. Um, but I think one rendering, and it suggested that, um, you know, we could close this road and have markets and um, festivals. And um, it's not clear as to whether or not, apart from one sentence in the report that says um, uh, the, the rooting of the Naughton Street connection does not have to exist in order to accommodate um, these plans. You know, there's a lot of people that will be very impacted by this and, and others that um, will not. Um, but I think it's really important that we're as transparent as we can be with the community and, um, and communicate um, the clarity of what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, for me, it's about livability for this area. You know, I want to understand going forward, where is the transportation plan for the area? Where is the transportation plan for the construction? Um, when do we get that uh, plan submitted? Um, uh, as far as um, how we want to um, deal with the lower half of Gallant, we have no problems attracting people to that community. The problem is, is that there's so many people that it is an area on a sunny day that is a stream of cars driving around and around and around in a circle trying to find a parking spot. And then with this project, we're suggesting that we could even attract more people for festivals and markets um, in the summer. And, and I think the residents and the locals, you know, they've been dealing with this impact of all of these visitors for so long, it's becoming very challenging to be a, a local resident. Um, you know, we, we have done um, some work in regards to limiting access on the lanes, um, looking at parking. I know we're doing a pilot up in Lynn Valley. Um, I think the Cove needs to understand when they are going to be looking at some relief in regards to turnover and parking. Um, there's been a lot of discussion um, east of Mount Seymour Parkway, or rather north of Mount Seymour Parkway. Uh, I think that's the correct um, directional um, 
routing in regards to resident only parking, for instance, um, and the impact of, of how residents deal with um, visitors on a regular basis. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to be cleared up for the community. Um, I did get a call earlier today that um, some property owners, and I'm not sure, and I, I just need clarification. Um, I think the businesses had letters brought to them, but not all the businesses own the property. Um, of, there are a lot of uh, lessees, uh, renters. And um, so I think there's this kind of little bubble in the cove right now. I think there is support for a pedestrian and cycling connection and a new way of routing um, cyclists through the cove because right now they, they ride down Deep Cove Road onto Gallant. And when we put in the, um, the plaza and we had big signs that said, do not enter down Gallant because we had turned it into a one way, a lot of people drove down that one way on their bikes. Um, so I think the Naughton connection would provide a natural circular motion down um, Banbury and then up Gallant again. But I do not believe and I will not support um, a permanent connection um, off Deep Cove Road down Naughton for the foreseeable future. I will support a pedestrian and cycling connection. But I think within this report and within some of the information that we have um, um, circulated to the community, there seems to be this concern that there's been assumptions that have been made. And I think we have to be really careful about that because um, I, I see that there is a middle ground here, a balance um, in trying to create some livability, but we have to understand the impact that the Cove already goes through with the thousands and thousands of people that come down there. And uh, there has to be a balance to the livability and the, and the interest of people wanting to visit the area while supporting the businesses. Councillor Mary, we are at six minutes, so I'll just get a quick comment from staff, if I may. I've got Mr. Joyce and Mr. Stewart both wanting to comment. I'm going to go to Mr. Stewart first. Your Worship, staff are, are not proposing at this point any permanent changes other than to address the storm sewer issues. Uh, we, we know that we're probably going to have to do some temporary work around um, transportation, but uh, we're not assuming that there's going to be a permanent uh, vehicular route uh, along the continent at this point. I think what we'll be doing is we're applying for grants. We'll see what we get. And then we assume that the more permanent changes to, to Deep Cove will require a lot more communication and consultation than will doing the necessary work around a storm sewer. So really the, the connection amongst uh, with, with respect to McDonald is really intended to make sure that we're minimizing the impact on the on the cove with respect to the stormwater project. But uh, we'll wait and see what we get for the grants and we'll certainly be uh, reporting back to council in terms of what we might do next steps after the stormwater uh, project is completed. And as Councillor Murray has suggested, it may be at the end of the day that that McNaughton uh, uh, route is better suited to walking and riding and biking and that kind of thing and not to vehicular transport. And, th and that will be fine. We'll, we'll be able to work through that with the community. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Joyce, further comments? Uh, just to go back to what I said earlier, we started worship two separate projects. Mr. Stewart's aligned to. Um, I know Aaron's got a meeting coming up, a Zoom meeting with the Deep Cove Community Association to go through this, but they are two separate projects. Um, the li uh, Livable Deep Cove along Gallant. First and foremost is we must replace that um, a culvert on Gallant. We have to replace that. It's a utility project and that has to be done. Naughton is the logical place to, as a bypass to do that. And as Mr. Stewart alluded to, We'll be transparent and go back and review that community and what that will look like. We'll make applications for Little Deep Cove and we'll be back to council with what there's more conversation to have for the community should be successful on that grant. But I will say it was quite a success in the summer. So the expectation is we do something down there. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Next up, I have Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I not quite sure why, but I'm really feeling like I'm really out on um, left field here. Uh, this whole deep, livable deep cove, COVID resilience project, that title, I don't think I heard that title until December or November of this year. So I don't know how long that title has been around. 
I know that there's been discussion that the, about the culvert and, and that had to be done and what we were gonna do about traffic while that work was going on, but I never heard an actual title put to it until very late in the call. Anyway, I so I have a couple of questions. Um, there's only one project uh, allowed to be submitted for this grant. What other projects did staff look at besides this project for this particular grant? Uh, uh, you, you worship, I might see if Aaron could remember. Sasha, to our finance group, uh, takes those all in. Aaron, do you recall the other projects we reviewed? Um, I, no, I don't know the specifics. What I do know is we, because of the timing of the grant, we didn't have really any projects except this one that were at the right phase of design to meet the tight timelines for the grant program. Everything has to be done by the end of December, so it's a very tight turnaround. So when did we find out about this grant that we seem to always be up against a deadline on things? When did we find out about this particular grant and we could submit? Um, or yeah, uh, through your worship, um, the, the federal government and the province had loose announcements through late summer, and it wasn't until uh, December 1st, actually, that they formally rolled out the, the grant program. So it really was quite recent. Mr. Joyce? Uh, your worship, uh, Councillor Forbes, that's quite usual for this to happen this way. That's why you hear the term shovel ready. Um, both federal and provincial governments are quite renowned for turning around quickly uh, in a period of weeks and put these programs together and then have us uh, have projects to submit very quickly and turn around. There isn't a long time frame usually and this one was in response to COVID and so that's why you have the if the projects are ready to go or close to those are the ones you're, you're, you're putting forward. May I also say that I know we, we work directly with um, uh, the merchants in this situation. We also explored not related to the grant, but explored accommodations in Edgemont Village to be yes. uh, to uh, accommodate the uh, crowds that were occurring. And uh, the response we got back from the Merchants Association was that they were not interested in making such a dramatic change this time. And when you look at Lynn Valley as well, uh, the other challenge there is that uh, lots of the COVID challenges with lineups were actually falling on private property entirely on the Boza facility and others. And so this was one where uh, it, the, the spill out was occurring onto district property and, uh, and so all of, we had all of the cards, we were able to respond. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I guess, uh, you know, my question came up because this is, this title was relatively new to me and then this project was selected by staff and I hadn't heard anything uh, of what was being considered or I understand you can't control federal and provincial timelines, but I mean, given over December with Christmas in there, and I mean, it's a bit ridiculous for, their, for them to have a timeline like that. But um, I, I would hope that maybe we could have some kind of sort of even informal conversation to keep the other members of council up to date kind of on what's going on um, other than reading it a week before it comes up in a meeting and an agenda. But anyway, moving on, um, I'm concerned it says that uh, uh, we'll be responsible for eligible cost and overruns. And so I'm assuming that later on, on page 71, there's a mention of $250,000 prior to funding for approval um, uh, of uh, plans, basically. Uh, and I'm assuming that's one of the ineligible costs, but I'm a bit confused why that has to be prior to funding approval. Is that money we've already spent or money that we have to now consider spending in order to meet the requirements of this grant? Here. And Mr. Stewart and Mr. Joyce. Mr. Stewart? Yeah, your, your worship, quite, quite simply, um, we have had a mandate as staff to be chasing grant monies for now 10 years and we've been very successful. And so we literally look uh, on the different websites to find out where there are opportunities as they're announced on a weekly basis. And I, I know that isn't the way that everybody would prefer to do business, but sometimes that's just uh, the way that we're doing. The, the livability 
I, I think is a label we put on because we uh, felt that we were successful with respect to uh, the, the public areas in, in Deep Cove, but certainly we'll be having a conversation with council as to what if any of that actually happens depending on, on what occurs with the grant. The other comment that I would make is it's, it's I've not experienced grants where we get 100% of everything covered uh, in my life. Uh, there's always costs which we must bear as a municipality and there's always costs which we must uh, take into consideration uh, as to whether or not in fact we want to uh, uh, proceed with the project. For example, if we get something and, and only 20% of the costs uh, are approved, we then have to look at that on, on a priority basis and say, well, how does that stack up with other uh, projects? So uh, we have to, as Gavin has said, we, we, we have to do this stormwater. Uh, the, the, the potential with climate change and the, the significance of, of impact on the cove of, of uh, storm overruns are significant. We've experienced lots of them. And that's our main focus right now. Now, if we can do something to make um, Deep Cove more livable as a part of this process, great. But our focus is on A, the stormwater improvements, which we think are necessary, and then B, exploring opportunities with the community as to how we can address some of the concerns that they've got. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Any further comment? Uh, just uh, Councillor Forbes, first part of that comment. The recommendation wording is not ours. That is the federal and provincial government, and they require that to be uh, endorsed and adopted by council for us to be successful with the grant. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's uh, maybe some misunderstanding here. I applaud staff for going after the grants the, the way that they do. I know uh, um, they've been really good at getting us grant money for all kinds of things. So um, I don't, that's not, that's not where my questions are coming from. I think staff does an excellent job. I think, however, in that report, there's an acronym, A-R-D-M. And here we go with acronyms. What does that stand for? Adaptation, Resilience, and Disaster Mitigation. Could we please, if we're going to use an acronym at least once, in parentheses, put what the acronym is? Because... Page 68 third paragraph is right before it, it says uh, adaptation, resilience and disaster mitigation. Okay, I missed it. Sorry. Um, and what is a class D? And, and then it, it, I'm confused. It says what is or what is class D cost estimates and then in brackets plus minus 50% to 100% of 4 million. So I, I'm asking what class D is. I don't understand the parentheses and the four million. Is that what we're applying for under this grant? Mr. Joyce? I, I, I think uh, I'll go to, I, I can see Councillor Bond almost wanting to answer, but I think I'll go to Councillor Moxon on one this year, Your Worship. Uh, I'm called Councillor Moxon, is that? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> staff member Moxon. <laughs> You're jumping the gun, Gavin, a lot. Yeah. Um, promoted or demoted? We're not certain whether that's up so or down. Councillor Forbes, that's referring to the amount of contingency that uh, we place on a cost estimate. So a Class D cost estimate is a cost estimate that's developed relatively early on in the life cycle of a project when you're early in your design stage and you have a whole lot of unknowns left. So when we say that it's it's four million included in that four million is a fairly hefty contingency just to cover a lot of the unknowns yep. that we haven't sorted through yet. Okay, I got it. Thank you very much for the explanations. Appreciate it, and you're doing a great job, staff. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's uh, item eight point two. It was moved by Councilor Mary, seconded by myself. I see no further speakers on the matter. Call the question. All those in favor? Aye. I did. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to item 8.3, uh, different project, very same neighborhood, Mr. Joyce. Uh, Your Worship, uh, I believe we've actually had the overall conversation as part of the, the other item. This is the one that res uh, it refers to the Glen Creek Flood Conveyance Works. Uh, which is the infrastructure program. Um, so very similar. This is what I tried to start off with. This was the work that must be done as part of the utility work. This is the replacement for the uh, two meter culvert that runs uh, through Gallant. 
um, and the, the chosen transportation route is, is through Naughton, but this is, we've had a large part of this discussion as part of the previous item. So moved. Thank you, is there a seconder on the matter? Second. I second it. Second by Councillor Back. Councillor Murray, further comments on the matter? No, nothing. Councillor Back? No. Yeah, just my own comments on this. Uh, I, I understand that this is a critically important uh, project. I look forward to uh, the Deep Coat Community Association talking to staff uh, just to get more information out in the community. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very disruptive uh, project, and so communication will be key. A lot of those businesses are coming out of recovery uh, theoretically in the spring and summer months uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. And, uh, and here we are unfortunately having a, a big impediment to the recovery uh, taking place. And so uh, communication is going to be key, but uh, it is a very necessary project and I will be supporting it. Any further, oh, about Councillor Bond? Thanks, Mayor Little. I just want a question for clarification to staff. How much of the project is potentially funded by this grant application to the federal government? I see 100% of the eligible project costs, but uh, how much of the total project costs could be funded by this grant application? Mr. Joyce? I'll go to Ms. Moxon, Your Worship. Ms. Moxon? Uh, sure, if we're, we're talking about the, um, the storm culvert project now, um, if I recall, it's, it's not quite 100% because, of course, we've had to um, complete the detailed design and get it ready for tender. So all those costs can't be covered by the grant because those are expenditures that have, have already been incurred before we receive the funding. Um, but when you're talking about such a, a large project, it's a very small percentage that we've spent um, already. So we're nearing 100%. My comment would just be that this is uh, quite a outstanding grant opportunity. This is a project that we have to do anyways. Um, it looks, you know, class C cost estimate of around 7.9 or $8 million. That would generally be coming out of our district finances, out of our infrastructure reserve. But through this program, uh, it looks like almost all of that cost can be funded by the federal government. So I think that's a, a uh, huge benefit to the municipality should we be successful and uh, very supportive of this application. Councillor Bond, Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. I just, uh, I don't know if it's a misprint in the uh, package or not, but I'm just hoping that we got an extension because under the timing and approval, it says the deadline for submission was today. Ms. Moxon. Uh, yes, through your worship, that's correct. And we, we hit the send button uh, and it was sent in today to the province. So we, we made the deadline okay. Uh, we're allowed to follow up with the resolution from council um, in, in the coming weeks. Okay, thanks. I'm glad that I just wanna say, I'm really glad this is necessary work and uh, I'm, I'm very supportive and it's almost like Christmas all over again if they're gonna cover <laughs> to the cost for us. Fingers thank crossed. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Joyce, did you have a comment? Uh, just to reiterate what Councillor Bond had said, had not, we're not successful here. Council will still, still see this project in the Surrey utility because this is a project we must get done. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know how, it, how disruptive it's been uh, also when we've had rain events that have shut down businesses and shut down spaces there. Uh, the overflow is unacceptable and uh, and I think that people uh, will be much happier with the situation going forward. That whole ridge has become so active with high rain uh, events that uh, uh, I think it has a lot of people in that community uh, very concerned and so I'm uh, glad we're getting the work done. I see no further speakers from council so I'm going to call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries. Uh, thank you very much, Council. I'm now going to welcome Councillor Kern back to the meeting. Councillor Kern, can you hear me? Yep. Welcome back. 
Okay, we're moving on to item 8.4. This is election sign limitation. Uh, the author of the report was Councillor Back. So I'm going to give the floor to you, Councillor Back. Uh, I guess, will you be moving your motion? I will move the motion. Is there a seconder for, uh, for the motion? I've got uh, Councillor Curran. I'm gonna just go to some opening comments from uh, Councillor Back and then I'll go to Mr. Stewart. Uh, Councillor Back. Sure, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so the recommendation tonight is uh, that staff be requested to report back on options for limiting the size and height of election signs in the District of North Vancouver. Um, we currently have no restrictions on the size of election signs in our community. Um, and as a result, every election period, we do see a, a prolif proliferation of signs across the community of all, of all shapes and sizes. Um, as I've highlighted in the report, Your Worship, these large election signs um, that are unrestricted do have an impact on the streetscape and our neighborhoods. Uh, they can, in some cases, also cause a visual obstruction for drivers or those who walk or roll. And the volume of materials, much of which is that hard plastic material, does, does have a negative uh, environmental impact as well. Um, the large signs also come with a significant cost attached, um, particularly for those first time candidates as I experienced myself in the last uh, municipal election. And they require resources that I think actually make it an uneven playing field in some cases for, for all candidates. Um, well, there are many other ways to connect with the community in an election campaign, such as door knocking, um, attending events throughout the community, speaking at all candidates meetings and having an effective social media strategy. I think signs still play an important role and that's why I'm not in any means, by any means uh, proposing a ban on election signs. Um, but I do think that restricting the size and, and putting us in line with the city of North Vancouver uh, would be a positive move. So that's my opening comment, your worship. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Stewart, you had a comment? Yeah, Your Worship, it's more of an administrative matter. I just wanted to let Council know I could see the video uh, for the delegations and the, and the public input, but I just couldn't speak. My mic wasn't working, so I've switched computers. But since the, uh, the delegations and public input, I have been able to follow and participate in the Council meeting completely. Thank you. Where did the mayor go? Here's He's also been zoomed away. <laughs> <laughs> well, should, I, should I just, should we just DIY it? I mean, yeah, let's I, do it. Well, <laughs> election signs, I, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, um, I was, um, the I, I couldn't really hear the mayor very well. So I said that his uh, volume wasn't very clear. And he said that his um, internet connection was unstable. Um, so maybe that has um, dialed in. Okay, so I'm acting acting mayor, so oh. I will um, continue on until the mayor's internet becomes stable. So thank you for your comments, um, Councillor Back and Mr. Stewart, and the seconder is Councillor Curran. Yes. Um, so should I speak? You can make your yes. comments. Um, so thank you um, for bringing this forward. Um, I'm happy to see that it's a, a staff report because I will have different <laughs> suggestions for what would be on that staff report. Um, I do support a ban on uh, signs, which I know is different than what um, Councilor Back has, has asked for. But I think if staff is reporting back, it would be um, nice to have more options. I think that it, um, to your point about a uh, level playing field, signs are expensive and they're pollution. Uh, so I, I don't see a lot of benefit. There's actually been a few science, few um, social science studies that have shown that they actually don't um, help. <laughs> so I think they're um, not necessary in this time of ecological crisis um, and equity crisis and questions about who is involved in democracy. So. I uh, will support this, but I would like staff to report back on a little bit more. I was able to talk to a counselor in Brampton, Ontario, who brought forward a ban. Um, they already had a ban on public property, but they actually um, are looking to extend that to private property. And I know Surrey, BC has a ban on um, public property and Kingston, Ontario. Um, so there are some other municipalities uh, across uh, Canada that uh, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, 
Um, so it seems to be a, a trend that I'd like to be on the uh, front of. And I know that's not what's on Councillor Beck's report, but um, if staff's reporting back, I think that um, we need to look at this as a way of how do we get out the vote? Because I think uh, there's ways that the municipality can support uh, promoting that there's an election coming up, but without individual um, electeds making signs that are expensive, bad for the environment, and um, that pre prevent people who have more signs have potentially more visibility. Although, as I've said, um, there's little evidence to show that it actually helps. Um, so that's what I'd like to see happen and interested to see where the rest of council is on this issue. But thanks for bringing it forward to, to start this conversation. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Councillor Hansen. Thank you very much, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Councillor Back, for bringing this forward. Uh, it's uh, timely and uh, a good topic for us to be uh, discussing and a good topic for staff to be uh, commenting on. I do certainly support uh, the idea of limiting uh, size and height. And I know th uh, there was some discussion, as I recall, about uh, potentially uh, a ban on the use of plastics in signs and uh, the idea that we could have signs that were made out of wood, uh, which would be uh, more environmentally friendly. And uh, like Councillor Kern, um, uh, I really welcome the discussion, but uh, perhaps uh, put that for idea forward uh, as, uh, such that when staff do consider uh, the different options, perhaps we could uh, uh, consider more of an array of options, uh, different ways. I think there's a common goal and it's a very worthy goal, which is to uh, try to put some uh, context and uh, limitation over the uh, uh, littering, really, the the the, uh, uh, you know, the littering of our community with big and uh, unsightly and uh, disruptive signs. Uh, so, uh, but I would ask that we also consider what those signs are made of, because I think if they could be made of wood, uh, that would be, or some kind of uh, ply uh, uh, cardboard or some other substance apart from this non-reusable. As I understand it, a lot of the election signs are made of this uh, plastic that really is non-reusable. Environmentally disadvantageous for us. So, but thank you, Councillor Back. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I the two things mentioned in this report are, were are not my first concerns. So I would just like to. Um, mention also to staff when they a couple of points when staff comes back with a report on this um what i heard most about uh, when i was campaigning wasn't necessarily the size uh as much it, as much as it was the number of signs and so um I know that uh, West Van and North Van just came in with the regulations in, la in the last year, year and a half. And uh, it's not doable to go around and count, count the number of signs that are out there. There's, there's just no way that you could monitor that if you put that into some kind of a bylaw. But what you could do, which we haven't done in the district and which I think we could do, is we could make a point, and I'm saying this to staff, for the report, hopefully, we could make a point of saying that you can only put one sign in a location because often when you're coming off the highway or whatever, you get six signs of the same candidate. So uh, um, I think we should look at possibly putting in something about uh, one sign in a location. And I also think like uh, other municipalities, many of them, um, they have put uh, actual locations where signs can be um, put up. And so I think if the district controlled more the location of signs, like there are other municipalities who actually have a map and they actually like West Vancouver that actually lays it out with a picture um, to show you where you can put up a sign. So if, if we took more control of the location and added something that only one of the candidates sign at a time in a location, then I think we could control the number of signs. And that's what I'm more interested in um, the most, because I think that would take down a lot of that eyesore of massive campaigns. 
And then just adding on to that, um, uh, I think that if we start looking for wooden signs, we're starting then to increase the cost. I know when I had to pay for signs, it was a terrible, terrible shock what they cost. And trust me, I didn't go for the most expensive. But I think if we start mandating things like wooden signs, I think we're going to just up the cost so that the, it won't be feasible for uh, new candidates anyway to come into it and have to do their initial signs. Um, uh, I guess that's most of my points is, is if we could control those two things, I think we control a lot of the eyesore that's going on. And I just like to remind it's only, at least in the district of North Vancouver, it's only 21 days that we uh, have to put up with it. So, and, and the city of North Van, I think they're 30 days uh, and every municipality has a different time limit and when, how fast these signs have to come down. And we're one of the faster ones. Uh, that have regulated how fast they have to come down. So uh, as much as uh, the report mentions that we should be consistent with our other municipalities, we aren't on a lot of issues even to do with election signs. So uh, I'm not worried about that. I'm more worried about our landscape. So if staff would just consider those things, I'd appreciate it. Councillor Forbes, Councillor Murray. Um, thank you. Well. Um, up until the last election, um, I had reused one of my eight signs um, since 1996. Um, I would say that I um, have over the years run um, the most um, uh, uh, financially um, limiting campaigns of any candidate um, uh, that is run in the district of North Vancouver. Um, I never bought newspaper advertising, um, except a $40, um, credit card size note in the Deep Cove Crier. Um, I had eight signs that were strategically placed. Um, they were large signs and they came from, um, the lobby of guard, um, a concept that we use to, um, draw attention to the issues around Coven Mountain Forest. And uh, I used those signs um, through all eight terms. Um, some of them have quite a lot of duct tape. Um, you know, I, I, I was not ever interested in the repetitive smaller signs, although in the last election I did buy some. Um, and there was a reason for that. And that was for my support of um, other councillors that were running um, uh, in election, and I did that for them. Um, the, the larger signs, we actually have had this discussion over the years. Um, Mayor Little uh, will recall, and it was actually a motion I brought forward in regards to uh, signs. And um, it was specifically to do with sight lines um, where signs were being placed. We used to, they used to be allowed in the medians down the parkway. Um, they could be allowed on corners. Um, they were never allowed within the Ministry of Highways right of way, um, although people try. And, um, and uh, so we have had this discussion about signs over the years. Um, I think Councillor Forbes um, brings up a really good point that it's the repetitive number of the plastic sleeves that go around the wire frames um, that can get um, rather um, challenging. And we often find them, you know, they've fallen over or they've blown away. And uh, oftentimes they are not all completely recovered. And over the years, you'll be out and come across a, an election sign from 10 years ago. Um, I believe they're actually um, the most efficient way of drawing attention and the most affordable way of drawing attention to a candidate. Um, the newspaper ads are horrifically expensive um, and um, the signs provide an indication of a, of a process, a democratic process that is a very short period of time. Councillor Forbes has noted, you know, 30 days, but really the signs go up for about a two week period. 
Um, the District of North Vancouver and the City of North Vancouver and West Van um, have been immediate in the removal of those signs after the election is over the next day. Um, you know, there's lots of different groups that travel in the next day and the signs are all down. Um, having larger signs, fewer of them and larger signs, um, they're easier to remove than remember where you placed 500 smaller ones. Um, the, the issue about plastic, I totally understand. Um, I, I drove around with Councillor Curran when we were putting up her little hand-painted round paddles um, that she attached uh, throughout the community. And, um, you know, that was, a, that was a great option for her, that worked for her. Um, you know, she also had one of the most active um, uh, Instagram um, accounts uh, of anyone I've ever seen. And her reach through technology was considerable. Um, you know, not all candidates running in elections have that, uh, that reach. And, um, you know, I, I have no problem with looking at, um, you know, uh, uh, regulations to make sure that, you know, signs are placed in, in safe areas and, um, you know, being reasonable. I mean, I, we've certainly seen federal and provincial signs grow in size over the years. Um, this would certainly affect those campaigns as well. Um, and any signage that the municipality puts up to um, advertise the elections. And if it is about signage, um, you know, then why is it just election signs? It should be all signs. And certainly, um, you know, business, we have businesses that use signs. Certainly right now, there's a lot of businesses using a lot of signs saying we're open, we're here. Um, don't forget us. And it's an integral part of them drawing attention to themselves in order to continue that, those, that business. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I think that the um, intention of this, um, if we were having signs that were up for elections for months on end, and certainly when we go down to the U.S., um, it seems that they're in a constant election cycle um, between, you know, the different levels of government and the presidential elections go on. It seems like one start, one ends and it starts all over again. Uh, and there are signs all over the place. But, you know, for municipal um, and even provincial and federal elections, the amount of time is relatively short. Uh, I think we have been responsible. I think all of those signs that are purchased are reused. In fact, I know that. They're absolutely reused over and over and over again. And if, you know, that is, that's recycling at its best. Um, again, mine have been around for 25 years. I've used those signs for, and I've never, um, you know, over those years purchased those, you know, hundreds and hundreds of signs that many candidates do. Um, so those are my comments right now. Thank you very much, Councillor Murray. Uh, I believe next up I have Councillor Bond. Oh, I've been unmuted this whole time and I went to mute myself. Interesting. Must be quiet around here. Um, I, uh, I was actually quite, uh, I'm actually quite interested to hear your comments, Mayor Little, because I know uh, when I was first considering running for council in 2014, um, we had a quick meeting and your advice was get the biggest signs you can. You're a new candidate. Um, no one knows who you are. And I followed that advice and it might be anecdotal, but I got elected. So um, it is, uh, you know, and I, I think I agree with Councillor Murray on this one is that, um, you know, compared to uh, newspaper advertising, again, which I have I've not done in any of my com campaigns, uh, you know, spending uh, 2000 or $3,000 on, on signs for a, a new candidate is probably uh, one of the best ways to get uh, your name out there and get it visible, especially coming in um, if you're coming from, you know, a smaller community of influence or a, uh, or um, uh, just kind of uh, straight out of nowhere. I think, uh, you know, other than uh, social media, which is still, um, unless you're, you've got a, a large following, uh, like uh, Councillor Curran uh, apparently did on Instagram, uh, or you're uh, well established on social media, um, the spending dollars on social media are not effect, are not necessarily as effective um, until you get that larger following. So um, I, I'm interested to, you know, I am interested to hear a little bit more uh, of the discussion. So I will be supporting this going forward so that council can have more discussion. But um, I think, um, you know, I agree with a lot of the comments uh, about trying to reduce uh, waste. Um, 
but I, I think, and, and this is just kind of off the cuff, but I think that, you know, signs are one of those things that um, at least people running election campaigns, no one really knows whether or not they're effective. It's really hard to gauge whether they're effective. Councillor Curran mentioned, you know, some of the social studies that said that there might not be a, uh, much of an impact, but everyone does it anyways. And I know at least uh, on on my campaigns, the the process of uh, of sign making and sign distributing and fixing is actually uh, something that brings a lot of your team uh, together, um, and uh, it's it's kind of a common tangible goal that's not necessarily a meeting uh, or a uh, you know preparing for a debate, but it's a, it's a tangible thing that brings a lot of the people that are supporting a candidate uh, together. So. I don't know how how valuable that is in in the context of uh, of this whole discussion, but uh, I'm willing to have more discussion about that. So. Thank you very much, Councillor Bond. Uh, I've got some comments, Councillor Forbes. Are you a first time speaker? Have a call on this one. No, this would be my second time. So I'm just going to make some of my own comments then first before I, I come back to you. Then um, I. Uh, I, uh, I think that if, if people think that they're not effective, then they should just go into an election and not buy any signs. I think that's a great idea. Um, uh, my, my challenge is um, it's a great equalizer. It really is. When a young person is coming out into, uh, to run an election campaign, the thought of spending you know, $2,000 on a quarter page ad in the newspaper that's gonna run for a handful of days versus $2,000 to fund a, a full sign campaign obviously the value in the sign campaign is way greater than it's going to be to put the money into into media uh as social media develops and people come become more reliant on instagram snapchat and facebook and all of the other mediums uh, i think you're going to find that that's even more affordable uh but it, it it also has a challenge in giving you access to people that you're not primary secondary connected to in some way so it doesn't necessarily branch out to all audiences um I, I fully support any, uh, uh, any uh, limitations that are directly related to safety or protection of infrastructure. And so when we have uh, irrigation hoses underground, uh, you know, gardens and such, those areas should be limited. I support that. What this report looks like it's doing is it's verging into the aesthetic. Um, and it's, it's saying, you know, we don't like the massing of, 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 of them. And I just wanted to, to, to fire up a couple of pictures, if I may, uh, we'll see if this uh, technology works here for me. Um, possibly not. Uh, I think that uh, oh, it's all right. Here we go. Try that again. You able to see those pictures? I can see them. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. what, this is an example of is what happens when you go to uh, size limitations on signs. Proliferation of a massive amount of signs. Uh, signs go everywhere. You go down Third Street during a, 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 an election, and that is what you see. And what happens with large signs is people tend to congregate around smaller areas. And so if somebody will go out with a big sign, they'll put it at a key place. And a handful of little signs, medium sign size, they'll all show up at the same spot, but you won't see the proliferation throughout the community because they're at that key focal point. When you don't have the large signs, this is what happens. And uh, I think that this is um, not a positive thing. In, first of all, it's a total waste of money because you can't even read the signs, they're so tiny. Uh, you also um, have them going everywhere because there doesn't become these sort of dominated central spaces where, um, where, where large signs show up. This is an example of the federal, federal election. Obviously, there's fewer candidates involved. But again, because there is large signs at the one location, you don't see a proliferation of small signs throughout any of the rest of the area. Uh, instead, it focuses on, um, on just a couple of uh, key locations. Uh, again, sorry, this is the bottom of Third Street Hill looking up. Uh, again, you can see what happens when you have small sign limitations um, uh, in place. I had a few more pictures somewhere here. Sorry about this. I, I definitely did have a couple more photos. Um, uh, 
And so I'm not just picking on the city of North Vancouver, my friends in the city of North Van. Uh, I do have some from the district of North Vancouver from the last uh, election. And so here is one on uh, Mount Seymour Parkway. Uh, again, because large signs formed a base in and around an intersection, there's no proliferation of small signs down the side streets. They all happen in the one central location because that becomes the spot where everybody wants to be. And so it's not like the city's small sign problem where they're just strewn about um, everywhere and there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, here you have clear messaging. You have the ability to actually put some of your priorities onto a sign and convey information. Uh, in the past elections, I've used the signs to be able to advertise the date, uh, particularly when, you, when we had confusion in the 2014, uh, sorry, 20, uh, uh, 2011 election, I think it was. We had a federal election that was read on top of it, and I didn't want confusion with that. And so I, I went, took extra steps to advertise that it was a Saturday that it was occurring on and that it was uh, um, on a different date. So you have the opportunity to vary things up. Yes, I also used some small signs in the last election, very few. I think I only had an order of 100 uh, small signs and only ever put about 20 of them out. I may not buy the small signs again in the future. Coroplast is recyclable. Um, power washing it takes the image off and you can return it to some recyclers to, uh, uh, to be reused. Uh, and, but I would, I would support something that requires it to be a recyclable um, uh, medium for signs. And, um, uh, you know, it just, I think that there's uh, lots of opportunity to make sure that we're being safe, that we're uh, managing uh, the environmental impact and uh, that we're finding ways to, um, uh, to make sure that people have an equal opportunity to access uh, campaigns. Uh, signs, make it easy. My first election campaign, I think I'm just out of time here, but uh, signs in my first election campaign when I was 26 years old, I couldn't afford uh, a mail out. I couldn't afford um, uh, newspapers. My total budget was $600. And out of it, I bought six signs and uh, put them on three A-frames and just kept moving them around the community just to, to try and make it seem like I actually had some budget. And, um, and it was a way for me to get my name out. So I finished, uh, I think, 14th out of 21 candidates. Uh, but it was a way for me to get my, uh, my name out in a cost-effective way. And uh, if I had taken that $600 budget and gone to the newspaper, I'd have gotten one of those credit card size uh, pieces. And so it's just not even equitable at all. Um, any, any limits on, on safety? Of course I support. Limits on, on destruction of, of public infrastructure? Of course I support. If it's, if it's there to, uh, uh, to limit the aesthetic feel, that third street photo is what you get when you get rid of the big signs. You get a massive proliferation of small signs. All right, I've had my kick at the cat on this one. Um, I will stop sharing, I think. Uh, there we go. And now I believe I have Councillor Forbes next. Thank you, Your Worship. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> she might have been a bit biased when it was vote little and the sign was the biggest sign. <laughs> but in any case, um, no, I do agree with everything that you've said. And as I said, I'm more concerned about when you have six or seven signs in a row of the same candidate. That's, that's what I think is just a, it's a waste of resources. It's a waste of their time to do that. And I don't think, uh, I don't think it improves their chances of getting voted any more than the first sign did. But um, I just wanted to say, uh, I think Council Murray heard me wrong. I, um, the district is only 21 days we're allowed to have signs up. It's the city that allows 30 days. Um, but the other thing, I, I'm not going to be in favor of this report because we've had a lot of discussion now and there seems to be all of us have something we're interested in. I don't know, maybe it's something that we need to work, you know, take half an hour out of a workshop and just talk what everybody wants. I don't know, but um, I'm not very concerned about size or um, um, or what's in this report. I just would like to say also, this is just something else I'm throwing out there though, that when we do come to be making these signs or any kind of regulations on election signs, we have to also consider because the first time that I'm aware of anyway, uh, we actually had a organization, a slate, um, where the candidates that were in that slate, and I'm referring to building bridges, um, they submitted a, a, a 
some amount of money in there and then the organization spent or, or controlled the amount of signs for any particular candidate. Uh, and where they went. So any election signs, when we start thinking about doing any regulations, we have to consider that going forward, there may be a time when we have that situation again. Um, I, I quite personally, I'm quite happy that we're not party affiliated, um, but, or, or group or association affiliated, that we're all individuals, um, well, well, except for one. On council. Um, so I just want people to bear, <laughs> I just want people to bear that in mind that if we start making regulations for election signs, we have to consider that the future might change and it might be more like Vancouver, or, you know, it might be more party affiliated and then we have to make sure that the regulations cover that as well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Councillor Kern. Thank you. Um, so just a, a few thoughts, if, if, if it's helpful to move a motion to allow this to go back to staff as a more to report back on all of the issues that have been discussed, if there's a way to do that, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm we getting have it. That's, been, that's on the floor and it's been seconded. I would say that we probably, uh, we should probably test that before altering it at this point. Okay. Um, Limiting size and height of election. Okay, well, we'll just go through this this process to begin with. Um, I just wanted to bring up that I think the the much larger issue um, is that in twenty four years we've the highest voter turnout has been thirty six percent. So the issue is um, getting people to be involved in democracy and um, how do we go about doing that? And I don't think individual signs are necessarily the way that getting us closer to our goal of getting more people to participate both to run and to vote. So I, I just want to really focus on that because I think that's really important. Um, and I, I do think the costs are um, prohibitive for a lot of folks to be able to buy signs. And I think if the evidence shows that they don't actually help, you're doing it because you feel like you have to do it, but it might not actually not be effective. And so we're race wasting environmental um, resources and financial resources. So um, I, I do think that's one way to look at it. Um, and then the other thing is <laughs> to Councillor Vaughn's point <laughs> about the large sign, I made the lollipop signs out of wood uh, that was in my basement. And I think there were eight, maybe there were nine, I'm not sure. Um, but so I, I can also say, you said maybe anecdotally, you, a big sign helped you little signs either didn't, but it could have been my social media following of which most of is not in North Vancouver. So most of the people who, um, I think Councilor Mary is referring to don't actually live here and wouldn't have voted for me. But, um, I, I do think that I'd like to see this a bit broader. So I don't know if there's a, an appropriate motion for that, but. Mayor Little, if you'd like to just proceed with this, I think staff has heard an earful from all of us. So um, I just want that to go somewhere effectively. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, the, just because, I mean, this is the way Councillor Back has for, uh, put forward the report. It's that uh, this matter be forwarded back to staff for further discussion. And so if there's other aspects of it, when if this is supported, then I'm, I'm sure staff and Councillor Back can consider that. Uh, Councillor, oh, sorry, Councillor Bond, uh, I believe uh, you're up for a second time. Yeah, I won't add m much more, Mayor Little, other than I was uh, excited by the passion in your voice when you were talking about signs. I, I think uh, obviously this is a, a, a subject that's close to your heart, so I, I could hear the difference in your in your voice when you were talking about them. And um, I'm wondering if the, your um, screen sharing tool is going to be available to councillors or if that's just a, a mayoral privilege um, <laughs> that we have in the Zoom meetings. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it was actually interesting in the sign examples that you you brought up um, whose faces were obscured and whose weren't. And um, it's interesting to see that uh, algorithm. That's just an aside. But, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I appreciate the spirit of Councillor Back's motion. And I think there are some other issues. So uh, similar to Councillor Curran, if we can uh, incorporate those issues in this staff direction, I think uh, this discussion should continue at a further uh, time. 
Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Bond. And uh, I noted that as well. Uh, almost every single sign that Councillor Back had out there, Google Earth automatically blurred his face. So either it was a clear enough photo or it wasn't. And um, uh, some of mine uh, weren't blurred. Uh, the Building Bridges ones, I saw quite a few of them were not uh, blurred as well. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, Councillor Back. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, everyone around the table for your thoughts. Um, I really didn't think that this conversation would go on as long as it has, uh, but you've all contributed to it, and I thank you for uh, your thoughts. Um, my recommendation was, I thought, fairly straightforward in, in, in uh, suggesting size and height of signs, but I see now that uh, there's certainly lots of more elements of this, to, of this issue to consider. Um, there has been a lot of anecdotal uh, sort of evidence uh, said around this topic. And I just want to caution you all that it is anecdotal. I've I worked my whole career in marketing and advertising, and I can tell you that every medium works, whether it's signs or radio or TV or digital, it all works. Uh, it's finding the right mix. It's finding the right frequency. And, um, and so to say that signs are the only thing that works uh, or, you know, the main thing, not, not necessarily true. Uh, there's lots of other strategies to run a very successful campaign on, on a small, small budget. But um, I definitely hear what everyone's saying. I, I don't feel the support for this uh, motion necessarily, so uh, that's fine. But uh, I, I do appreciate the discussion and, and for everyone weighing in. Thank you, Councillor Back. Councillor Hansen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, I, I found, I'd like to thank everyone for their comments. I found the uh, discussion very intriguing. And uh, uh, like Councillor Back, I was... Uh, uh, not anticipating the discussion to be as uh, detailed, as informed uh, as it was. And I'm, I'm grateful that uh, people have put as much thought and um, uh, analysis into their comments as, as they have. I, I would like to echo the comment that um, uh, I, I support the motion, but it's more uh, support uh, for the idea of a discussion, uh, of uh, integrating the different ideas that have uh, been put forward. Uh, I think we have a shared uh, goal with respect to science, which is to create a level playing field uh, and to minimize um, uh, environmental harm and uh, make it as, as simple and uh, straightforward for prospective candidates as possible without uh, cluttering up our community in a way which is uh, uh, unnecessary and uh, um, um, counterproductive to the election process. But so I, I, I'm going to support the motion, but I, I wish that to be taken in the spirit of uh, support really for the for the broader discussion. And again, I thank you, Councillor Beck, uh, for bringing this forward. I do believe it's timely and I do believe it's important. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Murray. Maybe we could just send this to a workshop, um, tag it on to a workshop one evening just to con you know go over our thoughts and sort of have staff maybe bring something forward based on the comments this evening for a little bit of structure. Um, I think that would be more helpful. I think uh, the way it's set up right now is that it would be, if it was passed, it would be referred back to staff for discussion. It doesn't necessarily set a, a course. Uh, I think that the big investigation staff need to do is into uh, what we legally can uh, do and can't do. Uh, and there's a bunch of municipalities out there that have different uh, regulations in place. Uh, some of them are not legally enforceable, but they put them on the books anyway. Uh, and so that would be the key thing I would be after if this was to go back to staff is to talk about the legality of different options. What really is in our purview to regulate in an elections BC run uh, election? Is that an uh, amendment, Mayor Little? No, no, I think that that's, uh, that's what staff will have to wrestle with. Uh, but it's um, uh, at, at the end of the day, it's going to be, I, I, I take your direction, if, if once staff have had a, a, a go around with it, if, if council wants to have it come back to a workshop for further discussion, then that's the council's decision. Uh, council decides how to use our time. So um, I'll... I'll I, I'm not hearing anybody definitely opposing that. Let's wait for the vote and decide what the next step is then. Question. Uh, I actually have Mr. Stewart uh, wanting to comment. Yeah, Your Worship, if, if council supports a motion to refer this to staff, we'll take into account uh, all of the different issues that are raised up. Well, I will refer it to a workshop because there are a whole bunch of issues here which were raised, which are out of the scope of Councillor Back's report but we will certainly take that into account as we bring it back for a workshop. Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. 
see no further speakers on the matter. I will just respond to one uh, comment that Councillor Bond made about uh, incorporation of photos. Um, I did ask the clerk uh, before our meeting whether that would be uh, okay, whether it's something we've discussed before. Uh, he had said he had talked to a couple of council members about including uh, photos. Uh, you know, before we were virtual, uh, it, was, it would have been tough for us to run up and, and, and do the technology. Now it seems we have that technology at our fingers. Obviously, I need to practice it a little more before I go public with it. Uh, but uh, I think it's one of the benefits of being virtual is uh, sometimes a photo uh, tells a story a lot quicker than, uh, uh, than your six minutes allows. And uh, so uh, I'm happy to talk about it with, uh, with council if you guys don't like that as an option, or if you do, we can have a further discussion about it. But it's not something that's reserved for me except when I surprise people with it. Uh, uh, Mr. Stewart, your hand is still up. I think that's from before. Uh, I see no further speakers on the matter. So we're gonna go to the motion that was is on the floor from Councilor Back moved. Uh, and I believe the seconder uh, was, was Councilor Bond? Curran. Hey, Councilor Curran, yes. Councilor Curran is the seconder. So, okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded, uh, myself, Councillor Mary, Councillor Forbes, I didn't catch your vote. Uh, I'm I'm opposed. Okay, so I think that is four in favor, three opposed. If I counted that correctly, Mr. Clerk, uh, with uh, myself, Councillor Mary, and Councillor Forbes opposed. Uh, that's correct, Your Worship. That's what I have. Thank you very much. But I mean, obviously, you, uh, when staff have um, a chance to look into some of those other matters, we'll have a further discussion about it. But uh, I will try to convince you of my <laughs> the merits of my position. Uh, moving on to item 8.5. This is uh, bylaws 8455, uh, 8457, and 8458. Uh, rental housing project at 220 Mountain Highway, 1515 to 5055 uh, Oxford Street. Uh, this is a return pub from a public hearing. So council, you have uh, four and a two minute opportunity to speak to this matter. I see Councillor Hansen has put up his hand to speak first. Councillor, do you have a motion to put forward? I move the uh, matter be uh, proceed to second and third reading. Or yeah, I, I move the, that we, um, yeah, uh, that it go to second and third reading. And then I believe Councillor Back, you were the second, you were the next up. Do you second that motion? Sorry, yes, Your Worship. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Worship. Just to clarify, it's to give second and third reading to these bylaws. Give second and third reading. Fantastic. Mr. Yes, I, mis I misstated that, that, that uh, these bylaws be given second and third reading. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Councillor Hanson, go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll get to you, Councillor Forbes. I'm just going to go to the mover and seconder, and then I'll come to you, okay? Uh, Councillor Hanson. Yes, yes uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Your Worship, I'm very pleased to support this bylaw receiving uh, second and uh, third reading tonight. Uh, this project will, in my view, bring 140 much needed rental housing units to the district, including six uh, non-market rental units. When I campaigned for re-election in 2018, I made a commitment to the community that I would seek to slow the overall rate of development in the district, and I would support rental, affordable, and social housing developments, but not support further market development until overall housing development in the district became more balanced as between market housing and rental, affordable, and social housing. This development falls squarely within the category of housing I promise to support. The project is rental. The project is within close proximity to transit. The project includes units ranging in size from studio to three bedroom, with 50% of the units being two and three bedroom and therefore suitable to families. There are six affordable units. Uh, and these will be affordable to persons with incomes ranging from $39,000 to $49,000, approximately $20 an hour to $25 an hour for persons uh, who work full time. Parking is charged extra at $100 a month, which I consider to be appropriate and bicycle storage at $25 a month. Uh, the building height and density 
is congruent with other developments in the vicinity. And uh, the housing agreement will secure all units as rental units. So this can't be uh, converted into uh, stratified and converted into market housing. Uh, importantly, the project has public support. Uh, the community, in my view, broadly supports the expansion of rental housing options. And of the speakers at the public hearing, 19 uh, speakers in total, all but two expressed outright support uh, uh, for the proposal and the two that did not express outright support uh, did not uh, speak in opposition, but we're raising questions. Uh, so with those comments, uh, let me say I'm very pleased uh, to support this. I'm pleased to see rental housing coming uh, to the district and coming to this area. I congratulate the proponent and I congratulate staff on uh, bringing the proposal forward. And I look forward to these 140 rental units being available to the residents uh, of our district as soon as possible to fill, in my view, a much needed housing need. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Back. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, uh, Councillor Hanson's done an excellent job of just laying out the features of this particular project. Um, I think it would be uh, something this council could be very proud of uh, to see this uh, particular project move forward. Again, it's 140 purpose-built rental homes, which are much needed in our community. Um, it's the safest, most secure form of rental housing that uh, is in a real shortage. Um, among you know the ideas here, um, you know, I think there is going to be some real improvements to the bicycle infrastructure um, with the lane on Mountain Highway to the west of the site, which we know is much needed through this town center. We do need to make this safer area uh, for cyclists. Um, and I think this is an excellent example of transit oriented development. You're literally half a block from Bibbs Exchange and you're right next to rapid bus service, which we know is the precursor to more um, uh, reliable, frequent uh, transit service. So I think the site is, is perfect for this type of housing. I think the applicant has done an excellent job of listening to um, the community. And um, as Councillor Hansen pointed out, over 90% of the speakers that we had at the public hearing were there to, uh, to voice their support. So it's much needed and um, I would be proud to see this. Uh, go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Back. I have Councillor Forbes. Thank you. Um, I, it's a clarification for me that I really want to ask about. Uh, if I could ask the clerk to clarify something for me, um, some of the recommend are some of the uh, inclusions here. The amendments, I should say, that are being made to these uh, bylaws were mentioned in the hearing, but weren't actually. Um, laid out in the bylaw as it was sort of laid out to the public before the public hearing. Um, so I guess I just want to make sure have we in, have are we caught on any technicality there because we have we have amendments on all of these that are coming forward now. Is that is that a normal thing? I don't recall seeing amendments before. So if the clerk could just clarify that for me. I just to be clear though, um, I, I see the amendment to the OCP uh, because it's uh, got a higher density than the OCP. But this is second and third reading. And so wouldn't that have been, been done normally before even the first? Uh, it, it's the, the motion is not being amended. The motion is to amend the OCP. I don't know, Mr. Clerk, can you respond? Uh, yeah, you, yes, Your Worship. I don't think I quite understand the question. Um, th these four bylaws uh, for item 8.5 are not being amended. These for second and third reading are the same bylaws that were introduced at first reading and the two that had to go to a public hearing were considered at the public hearing in this form. Uh, perhaps the confusion lies in the fact uh, just what you were trying to explain, Your Worship, is that these bylaws um, amend the official community plan and amend the zoning bylaw. That's the overall intent of adopting the bylaw. The four steps of first reading, second and third, and adoption, uh, um, there's no amendment of the bylaws within that. These are the same bylaws that were introduced and went to public hearing. Does that make it any clear? More clear? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. 
I guess it was the way I was interpreting when it said amendments. Um, I thought that meant that we were amending something that hadn't been there before we had our public hearing and I oh. wanted to. Okay, good. We, I, I'm glad we could address that. Okay, thank you very much. Then I'd just like to say that um, I still have a couple of concerns about this project, but on the whole, we need housing and um, I think it's situated uh, practically in the center of a town center. It's next to a FIBS exchange for good transportation. I'm still concerned about the parking spots that come with this. And I'm not concerned the same way other members of council might be. I'm concerned that there's not enough because we've already seen what has happened when there hasn't been enough uh, parking in that area. It pushes it out onto the street. And so I'm concerned that it's, it's a uh, maybe a worthwhile goal to try to convert people to using public transit or bicycling or walking, um, but it may not always be possible and we may be creating another problem for ourselves when excess uh, cars are out on the road. That being said, uh, also my one other concern again is that uh, electric car um, wiring going forward should be at level two. Um, it's cheaper to do it in the beginning than it is at the end. And so I have some concerns about the charging stations that are in this unit, but overall, because it provides uh, more rental housing, I wish there was more affordable. I don't really think six out of 134 is what I would really want, but I can't get everything I want. So on that basis, I would be in favor of this project. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Forbes. Councillor Kern. Thanks. Um, trying to figure out what's already been said to not repeat. Um, the six units, um, so 134 purpose-built rentals, six of which are at 20%, the 20% um, below uh, the district um, median rent, um, which I liked. Seven units are enhanced accessible design, which I think is really important. Um, their bike spaces outnumber the parking spaces. It adheres to our newly adopted step code with a low carbon energy system. And I just wanted to, um, if Adele, I'm sure he's listening, right? Um, that we worked through this. Um, we went through a lot with the energy modeling um, for this. And I think it revealed a lot of challenges with um, BC Hydro um, and with building in a floodplain and putting mechanical equipment in a parking garage. And I think the more that we push um, to do what we need to do, the more it reveals and we can work um, together on solutions. And so I really appreciated uh, the applicant's willingness to um, push through that. I think we end up with a, um, a project that is below uh, the newly adopted um, step code uh, before we even adopted it. So I think that shows leadership on the applicant's um, side and reveals some systemic barriers that we need to continue to push through. Um, I love the indoor community space. I love the commitment to really talking about the people who live there in terms of their health and their happiness and their well-being. And I thought that um, we don't hear that enough from people. Um, and the tenant relocation, uh, so the, the houses that are there, uh, the people moved in knowing that they were short-term leases or that was a potential to be redeveloped and the applicant is exceeding the tenant relocation um, that the DNB requires for that. And hopefully the, um, some of those tenants will move back into the building. Uh, I like the rooftop garden and the play area. I appreciated the two dedicated car share spaces uh, that there was a mix of family units. The FIBS renderings, if people haven't seen them, is uh, I think 2022, Mayor Little, can you confirm, is that sort of the, the time frame uh, for that being on the side here. Most of the road construction around will be done by the end of 2021. Uh, yeah, I think it, I saw an 18 month timeline. Like, I'm, I'm always going to assume it takes longer than anyone says because it does. Um, but it is actually quite an improvement um, that's been decades and decades um, uh, overdue and in the works. And I, I just wanted to talk a bit about. Um, that whole area, I find when I look at it from GeoWeb and when I look at it through riding my bike, uh, Councilor Back pointed out Mountain Highway, it's terrible. Um, it's an atrocious place to be on a bike. Um, but 
we really need to do more to, um, and we do have budget to plant more trees and to do more um, pollinator friendly gardens. And I feel like this applicant is looking to do that with um, looking at an urban ag agriculture plan. Because when you look at that area of our municipality compared to other areas, it is not green and lush. And I think that we need to do um, better. And I know there are some future enhancements with the green spine, et cetera. Um, that could do that, but I think there's more we could do even as it is because as that becomes a more of a community with um, both jobs and housing, we want it to be green and centered in nature. I think that's really important. And just where we need to go, um, uh, obviously I'm, su I'm supportive of this if that's not clear, but the embodied energy, we're still, there, there's still a lot that we're not doing. Um, and the reason that that's a concern is that be up to 50% of the embodied energy we're not even considering. And so um, we really need to do that. Um, and I do think the applicant understands that um, we need to be aiming for higher standards of construction so that these buildings are more energy efficient so that we're not worried about cost um, implications with BC Hydro, um, that the buildings require very little energy to run and that the energy that they need can be generated on site through solar. Um, I do agree that the charging policy, the charging infrastructure policy needs to be updated, though uh, there is no path forward to either reach Clean BC or any of the IPCC targets using uh, with electric vehicles versus um, mass transit that's decarbonized. So I want that to be the future. I like the location um, for this. And I really uh, think that Redick, the Adele and Hamid and Jean-Jacques and Armin and Ryan um, like you need to put information on your website <laughs> about um, some of the work that you're doing and we need to all uh, work together to achieve these goals that we're going to that we're going to get to. So I just noticed that there wasn't a lot about that. And I think that we all need to be talking about how um, we're working on this um, monumental task together. And uh, so I appreciate that. And um, I look forward to seeing this built. Thank you, Councillor Kern. Councillor Bond. Thank you, Mayor Earl. I think my colleagues have made a number of great points, and I'd like to thank Councillor Hansen for covering the more uh, salient details of the proposal. And like Councillor ha Councillor Hansen, I also campaigned on uh, on a strong focus on rental housing uh, in my uh, most recent election at campaign. Uh, I also think we need a lot more of this type of, of housing. And, you know, we're catching up on decades and decades of disinvestment in rental housing and in rental homes. And over time, I think uh, we need to see construction of more of these types of homes uh, more often so that we have a much larger than our current 3% of our homes that are uh, purpose-built rental, most of which are old. Uh, if we continue to approve projects like this, over time and over decades to come, uh, it provides a much, much more options and a much better selection for people who are choosing to rent or uh, and live in our community. I think right now the choice is either between something that's 50 years old or, or brand new. And I think projects like this happening again and again and again over time um, provide that range of both types of housing but also of different uh, affordabilities uh, over time. You know, it's a long-term project. We've had almost three or three or four decades of disinvestment in the sector. It doesn't get fixed overnight. And so I think seeing this project go forward is one step in the right direction. Councillor Kern mentioned uh, the efforts of the applicant to address uh, well-being and living in a close-knit community. In, in this building, I, I really appreciate those. It's something I've been uh, mentioning in a lot of our housing workshops is talking about the design of multifamily and to really address um, making multifamily communities uh, much more uh, community focused. And I think the addition of the, uh, the common areas and the amenity areas and kind of the philosophy that the applicant has uh, laid out towards their approach, not just to constructing, but also managing this building will make this uh, an excellent place uh, for those people who are going to live here. Um, I don't have uh, any other major comments at this time, other than to say that uh, this area of our municipality 
uh, does have a lot, uh, is undergoing a lot of change. Uh, I see that change and, you know, I'm through this part of the municipality almost every day, uh, mostly on my bicycle, uh, as exciting. And I think there that uh, there's a lot of amenities close by, you know, we've invested in Sealand Park. Uh, there's lots of uh, access to nature. Uh, there's lots of shops and services and employment opportunities. It's if you're even if you're working over in Vancouver, it's close to transit and uh, other abilities to get over to Vancouver. So uh, it's a great location. Looks like a great project uh, from everything we presented, and uh, I'm excited to see it move forward. Thank you, Councillor. I've got Councillor Mary. Uh, thank you, Mayor Little. <clears throat> um, uh, I uh, my my concern um, for this area over the last uh, 10 years is the amount of um, construction uh, and development that had been approved. Um, developments that um, will take years. In fact, um, Sealand still is not a completion. And I think you were a counselor um, when that decision was made, Mayor Little, and then took a break and then came back and um, it's still not complete. So some of these large projects can go on for um, many, many years, um, 10 years. And, um, and when zoning is all approved, um, that can be challenging to manage, especially when, um, you know, in, at this particular site, um, we've got the lowering of Mountain Highway underneath the rail bridge um, south of Main Street. Uh, we, we continue to wait for the improvements. That conversation has been going on for 20 years um, at Fibs Exchange. The interchange that um, we are um, watching, um, you know, be built within our community, but is a year behind. Um, all of those things contribute to um, the issues of access and ability to move around. Um, a pandemic um, certainly has impacted that as well. Um, we did have a very good public hearing. I, I chaired the public hearing that evening for yourself, Mayor Little. And um, I will say, although I continue to have concerns in regards to construction, um, I think that um, the benefits of this um, project, and I certainly will share um, my um, comments in regards to the development and the approach that the developers took in regards to the amenities, um, the design of the building. And, um, and I too was um, appreciative of their approach to the livability of the people that were going to be part of this project. Um, I thought that was something that I hadn't heard. Um, you know, I don't hear that enough. And uh, I thought the comments from the development developer in regards to, um, you know, how people are going to live, the fact that they're going to manage the building and uh, um, the amenities, including, and this has been mentioned, the rooftop terrace, the play areas, the indoor space, um, and, you know, um, wanting to be able to return some sort of a natural element to the area. It's quite hard down there. Um, there's a lot of density and um, there's a lot of projects that are going on. Um, you know, as we look at market rental, and, and we certainly have a smattering of affordable units, um, we always wish that it could be more, um, but we understand the economics of these projects. Um, you know, as uh, increases to rental is allowed under the provincial um, government's um, rental housing policies, um, it does um, give one concern that, you know, the, the price going forward of, of uh, housing and rental housing. And certainly I recall Paula Huber, one of our previous planners, told me years and years ago, Councillor Mary, the only affordable housing is the old housing. And that's true. Um, you know, we've, we've removed uh, certainly a, a sector of affordable housing that once was to make way for market. Um, you know, I think that was a mistake. Um, I think what we are doing now as a council is what we should have done years ago. And I think we would have been in a much better place and um, displaced a lot fewer people um, if we had tried to embody a more balanced approach to housing. Um, but that was then and this is now and we move forward. Um, I do like the design of this building. Um, I think the, um, the 
the balconies and the wood elements on the building um, are appreciative. I, I hope that, um, and if the developers are listening, I'm sure they are, I hope that you will market um, in your um, materials that there is limited parking in the area. Um, come without a car, use the services in the area, take advantage of the flat to geographical nature of the area and, and come with alternative forms of transportation. Um, this will be an issue we will need to deal with. Um, I do also want to protect the industrial nature of this neighborhood, um, the, the commercial sector of this neighborhood on the west side of Mountain Highway is critical to the overall um, sustainability of the community going forward. We want to keep those jobs there. We want to keep that eclectic nature of this area and not make it all shiny and new. Um, so. I, uh, I will be supporting this project and I will hold staff um, to the construction management plan. And we are going to have to do this very, very carefully and very well and be very thoughtful in how things progress. And, um, and I think the, um, you know, the area that we're losing, the parking area, uh, the FIBS uh, parking area, that is gonna come as a shock and there is going to be a definite impact to the loss of that, um, that parking lot. For those that commute from areas such as Lynn Valley or Seymour, um, when they want to take alternative forms of transportation, that option will no longer exist. I think that's a loss. A park and ride needs to be returned to the area in some way. And, um, and I think the, um, the, the residents that live at the building next door, um, it's going to come as a bit of a shock to them um, when they don't have that evening parking because they have utilized it as their own because um, there are so many cars that have come with that rental building. So um, with those points, I will be um, happy to support this project. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Mary. Um, it's just my own comments of, I think Council's pointed out the, the major benefits of this. I, I will reiterate what Councillor Kern said that it's critically important to have um, such uh, the enhanced level, uh, afford, uh, enhanced level accessible units within the project uh, so close to transit. Um, I remember back in the day when um, uh, the first proposal on this street, the first modern proposal on the street came forward and the council, um, we approved first reading, even though it didn't comply with the OCP and we stopped everything. And then we went back and we amended the OCP to accommodate a higher density on the site. And then we resumed back the original uh, proposal. And so um, we, we, we just saw it was such an important thing to have uh, uh, a certain form and density in this space to take advantage of the uh, transportation capabilities here with uh, the proximity to, uh, uh, to Fibs Exchange and how flat the neighborhood was. And so uh, I'm glad we did that then. Uh, the ask here today is that we push it uh, slightly a bit more. I think it's reasonable. I think there's, there are a lot of benefits to come forward with this project and, uh, and there's a reasonable justification for an increase uh, in the density. Um, a couple com a couple councillors have commented on the gap. You know, for a 17 year period, not a single purpose built rental was approved in the district of North Vancouver. Uh, we have to be intentional about adding these kinds of projects in. Uh, finding places for them to work and incentivizing um, uh, developers in the right ways to make sure that they take place. In this case, it's a, a modest bump in, in, uh, in uh, FSR uh, that is still within keeping at the neighborhood. And I think that it's uh, definitely a benefit back to the community. Uh, I am uh, supportive of this project, but uh, I think uh, council's already done a great job of covering all of the many reasons why. So uh, I'll end my comments there. Council, I see no further speakers on this uh, item. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Say aye. Contrary minded? Nay. Mr. Stewart, or sorry, Mr. Gordon, just want to confirm that you have unanimous support from Council for the project. That's what I see as well, Your Worship. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Council. I've had a couple of requests for, uh, for a stand up stretch before we get into the last item. Uh, so I'm inclined to, uh, to take just two minutes at this time, but no, no more. Uh, as they say, uh, sitting is the new smoking. So get up, stretch your, your legs, exercise a little bit, and then uh, we'll get back to it in two minutes time uh, to address uh, the last item on the evening's agenda.
right, I'll call back the council. Mr. Clerk, just before we proceed, I just wanted to double check um, that we handled that last motion correctly. It was both an OCP amendment, which has one, uh, which has a different voting calculation on it, uh, and then the other matters, which were bylaws. Uh, did we need to bifurcate those and deal with them separately, or is it okay to deal with them all at once? Uh, no, Your Worship. Uh, as it turns out, they were uh, okay, treated all as one. Um, we would prefer if it looked um, marginal, dicey, we'd like to bifurcate them because as you know, and a reminder to council, official community plan votes require a majority of all council. Uh, given that all seven were attending tonight, um, a majority to pass it would be four. But if we were at six, um, then it could be, or five, it could be any other combination of less than four. It's a majority of all council members, not just those present. Um, we would have asked for it to be bifurcated, but we are safe tonight. I also noted as we were going through it that um, in the subject line of the report on page 179, it says 8455 comma 8455 uh, duplicates the number. It should be 8456 for the second one. Oh, uh, typo, uh, my apologies for that. Yes, you're correct. Moving on to item 8.6. This is uh, bylaws 8423, 8424, uh, 8425, or 904 to 944 Lytton Street, Seymour States. Council, is there uh, somebody move a recommendation? I've got Councillor Back. Is there a seconder for uh, Councillor? And I'm assuming Councillor Back, your recommendation is the staff recommendation. Is that correct? Yes, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Seconded by Councillor Bond. Okay, Councillor Back, your comments. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this development uh, proposes to introduce 341 new homes into our community uh, with a mix of 33 non-market rentals in partnership with Hollyburn Family Services, 56 uh, market rentals, 25 rent to own homes, a Habitat for Humanity townhouse and a small commercial space that's likely to be a coffee shop. Um, the, site, the site is over six acres in size um, and the development is going to be constructed in two phases. So I would just like to touch on a few of the aspects of the proposal uh, that we have heard and, and we've heard from the community. Um, over this term of council, I have not seen an application that's been supported by the level of community uh, engagement that this one has. Um, I do wanna commend the applicant for, for going out and really listening to the community in the way that they have um, and for doing their best to listen to what kind of development this council is prepared to support. Um, and I can tell you as, as someone who sits at this table, that hasn't always been easy to, uh, to determine. So I, I appreciate the extra effort that they've gone through um, to really try and, and, and hear what we are asking for. Um, I listened carefully to all of the comments made over the course of the two-part public hearing. And I read over 500 pages of correspondence uh, that were related to this from the community. And it's clear to me that there is a high level of support for this development in this location. Um, we've heard from people who want safe and secure rental housing. We've heard from people who want to just get a foot into the housing market and for whom the rent to own element of this project would give them that opportunity. We've also heard from people who are looking at the limited housing options that are available for their children to stay in or perhaps come back to this community. And finally, we, we've also heard from people who have lived in this community for decades and they would like a place to downsize to so that they can remain living here. That's just a sampling of, of the types of people that we heard from um, as a result of this application. This application has made uh, a commitment to making this a zero fossil fuel energy site. And as has been highlighted, this may be the first project of this size to do so in our region. And I think that's a feature that we could be extremely proud of uh, as a municipality and as a community. That's not to say that this project is unanimously supported by our community. We have heard from some residents who fear the increase in traffic um, that this development could potentially generate. I want to highlight the elements of this project that are aimed at reducing vehicle use, uh, including three car share vehicles and hopefully many more uh, in the future. Uh, the introduction of on-demand transit service and close to 800 bicycle spaces with over half of them containing plug-ins for electric bikes. 
What we need to remember is that building anything takes time. It takes years. And the earliest that this project would begin construction would be 2022 and take a minimum of three years to complete. I do believe that with the focus and attention that transportation on the North Shore is being given right now by the various levels of government, we are going to see improvements well before this project is even complete. Um, perhaps one of my only criticisms uh, of this proposal is the lack of a daycare being included. Um, this housing is largely geared at families and we already have a, a real shortage of daycare spaces. Um, however, my understanding is that there are no provisions for childcare on this site. However, I think we need to be making new childcare spaces a priority for any future developments uh, like this one and in locations like this. In closing, I think it is fair to say that our community and indeed um, our entire society is fearful of the unknown. That is entirely understandable. But in this case, I think the benefits of a development like this far outweigh any negative impacts and it will bring renewed vibrancy to this part of our community. As has been pointed out, if we decide not to support a rezoning on this property, we are uh, deciding by default that we're supporting the creation of 115 or so market townhomes, which can already be built under the current zoning without any of the diversity of housing or with the same environmental commitments um, that the application has made, uh, the applicant has made on this project. So with all of that in mind, I am pleased to be able to cast my vote in support of this project moving forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Bond. Thank you, Mayor Little. I'm going to start my own timer here since we don't have one uh, like we did back in the council chambers. But uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Back for the excellent overview of the project. And I'll, maybe I'll just focus on a few areas that I think are, are particularly uh, beneficial to our community. Um, of the 341 homes, uh, 33 of these homes are non-market rental homes. And that's, uh, that's a significant percentage. That's almost 10% of the entire homes being proposed. And the rents proposed for these homes, which are a variety of studios, one, two, and three bedrooms, are actually a significant discount. I don't think the level of discount here should be overlooked. Uh, the, should council approve this uh, proposal, it means that a single person making $20 an hour can afford a brand new studio apartment in this amazing neighborhood. This neighborhood that's been a great place for multifamily housing for the past 50 years and one that I think uh, will be a great place for multifamily housing for another 50 years to come. It's close to schools, it's walking distance from schools, it's walking distance from a rec center. Uh, and although the bus doesn't come that often, it, there is a direct uh, bus to downtown Vancouver that is quite uh, useful for uh, people, at least when they used to commute to their offices in downtown Vancouver. We don't know how that's going to go. But, you know, it's not, and it's not just that single person who might live in that studio. It's a couple with kids who are both working minimum wage jobs. They'd be able, for, oh, sorry, they'd be able to afford a brand new two bedroom apartment. A single parent working as uh, in a profession such as a teacher uh, with their children would be able to afford a brand new three bedroom apartment. And when you compare that to the prices, even if you look just across the street at the uh, Blue Ridge apartments, where a one bedroom is significantly more expensive in a 50 year old building, where a three bedroom might rent for $2,400 to $2,800 a month, the level of discount and the number of homes that this provides for people of lower and moderate incomes in our community to rent should not be discounted. And, and I know that comes at, at a, a cost. <laughs> if, if you would say a cost, if we consider housing a cost, which I, I certainly don't, uh, of a number of market homes, market apartments, uh, market uh, townhomes, stacked townhomes and individual homes. Um, what I'd like to say is that uh, on this site, the number of homes proposed is actually significantly lower than what was envisioned in our 10-year-old uh, official community plan. It's actually closer to what was in line uh, with the 20-year-old uh, plan, uh, the Maplewood area plan. And if 20 years ago, planners in the community thought that this would be a good site for more housing in approximately the amount of homes that are being proposed right now, then I think this proposal's time uh, has come. Uh, you know, I have some other comments here about uh, traffic. I think Councillor Back has addressed some of those comments, but maybe I'll save that for uh, my uh, a second round of comments. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Mary. 
I think I've got this under, I think I've got this at four. I may go over, um, I'll go into my second speaking time, but I wouldn't, I, I may appreciate um, keeping the uh, leftover time um, available. Um, Maplewood, where this application resides, um, uniquely, uh, like Deep Cove is part of Seymour and the needs to be uh, and, and needs to be planned within the context of limited geographic access. 20 years ago, the council removed uh, this site from the Seymour local plan for political reasons. The, Salim, C, the Seymour local plan was developed by local residents to protect the livability of the area, address infrastructure, consider the densities that the DNV and our neighbor Slaywatooth were planning and to protect our environment. Prior to 1996, the forested character of Seymour was continually being developed. The Seymour local plan worked hard to find a balance. Congestion on Highway 1 and the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge has created significant and regularly occurring backups and gridlocks due to overcapacity. In the Seymour, there are no alternatives to go around. These occurrences today happen on a regular basis with thousands of cars idling, waiting to shop, work, recreate, or just get home. As the North Shore and the Ski to Sky corridor densify, the improvements of a single lane er, of a single interchange still begs us to ask the question, will it make a difference as we continue to build? Most agree, efficiencies yes, solutions no. The number of cars in North Van continues to rise. Our geographic position is one of the great is one of our greatest assets. However, it is also one of our biggest hurdles. Few solutions are available other than reducing our reliance on the car. Committed funding from senior levels of government continue to fluctuate. Land use issues, including employment centers and competing funding for real transportation solutions, present us with challenges that we must face head on. Clearly understanding what will happen to this community and our environment if that land use and money does not materialize. We are the little guy in this game. We need to understand the implications before making the decisions. The big unknown, the one that pales in comparison, is how are we going to pay back the cost of this pandemic? Development does not pay for development. Taxes and assessments are way out of the reach of most. The condo market is driven by investment. As interest rates will continue to remain at 0% into 2023, based on what the Bank of Canada is stating, the commodity of housing and offshore investment will continue. Our role is to make sure that we connect the dots to work for the electorate in a transparent and logical direction based on today's challenges. We need to look at the big picture. We need to pause and give careful consideration to decisions that can't be reversed once made. How has this pandemic changed how we live? Developers have shown that they are willing to detour with previous plans when a majority of council is willing to stand firm on the importance of a sustainable community. We are actually gaining traction from developers in Lower Lynn who are now considering low income housing mixed with market. Why? Because we have set a new course. Let's continue concentrating on town centers. Rezoning is not a right, it is a privilege. Developers are aware of that, it's part of their business. The district remains one of the largest landowners in the region and we have the ability to consider options, options that can benefit all of us. The better and more responsible outcome is to work with Anthem to consider sites in town centres to accommodate this project while freeing up opportunities to truly support the broader community. Our neighbours Slaywatooth are planning to develop the Innovation District. We need to understand those plans in order to address the needs and infrastructure to support continued livability. We have to understand what is coming. Over the years, Seymour has grown into one of the largest, largest recreational destinations in Metro Vancouver. Again, with only two ways in and out. The visiting density alone, regardless of future development applications, needs to be critically considered. How are all these people going to move around? Are we to support the needs of the broader region? I'm just about finished, Mayor Little. Many of which are developing intensely while relying on us to supply them with their rec recreational backyard. The valuable, valuable gains of electric, ener electric energy will be lost by the significant impacts of GHGs created by well over 600 new vehicles on and off site to the area as a result of this application. 
This suggests we are actively encouraging increased single use vehicle occupancy to an area that already struggles with too many cars. I thought our environment was the priority. This level of density belongs in a town center close to services, not on an island. It is larger than many of the projects being considered or under construction now in other centers. Our role is to look at the community as a whole. Our OCP review is not completed. The detail innovation district plan has not been shared with counselor of the community. The pandemic has presented a multitude of scenarios for consideration and the significant amount of visitors to the area has been unprecedented. We need to look at the whole picture that takes into consider all of these consideration, all of these challenges and opportunities. We need to pivot when change is upon us. Please pause on this one. We can work with the developer to find solutions that benefit people, the environment and our livability. Thank you. Okay. okay, next I have Councillor Hanson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, with the greatest of respect to those who uh, are uh, supporting both in the public and on council, uh, this rezoning, uh, I will not be voting in favor of this rezoning receiving second and third reading. I did not support this rezoning uh, going uh, at the point of first reading. I do not believe for reasons uh, very similar to those stated by Councillor Murray, that this level of density in this location is in the best interest of our community, nor is supported broadly uh, by the broader community. I also do not believe that my voting for this rezoning would be consistent with the election promises I made in uh, the 2018 local government campaign, where I committed to slow the pace of development and prioritize rental, affordable and social housing over further development of market housing. This site is currently zoned for 114 townhouse units. The proposal calls for 341 units on this site a three-fold increase in density. Included in the 341 units are 252 strata units, of which 25 are rent to own. 33 non-market rental, being 9.6% of the total. 56 market rental, being 16.4% of the total and 25 rent to own of the strata units being 7.3% of the total. Taking out rental affordable uh, and the affordable rental and the rent to own leaves us with approximately two thirds of the units as strata ownership. These will cost, we are told, between $500,000 and $800,000 for the condos and between 1 million to 1.3 million for the townhomes. I support and value the efforts of the proponent to include affordable rental, rental and rent to own. I also support and value the inclusion of the single habitat for humanity unit. However, the fact remains in my view that this is essentially another market strata development. The district has seen so much of this kind of market, expensive uh, market strata development over the last several years. The inclusion, in my view, of these percentages of rental and affordable units does not change the characterization of this development as a market strata development. If I voted in favor of this proposal, I would be voting for more expensive, highly densified market strata uh, and I would be thereby failing to live up to the promises that I made to the electorate in the 2018 campaign. There's many reasons to be cautious for placing this level of density in this location. The proposal calls for 552 parking spaces. Traffic remains a significant issue in the Seymour area and in this vicinity in particular, Adding this number of vehicles could only aggravate that problem. In my view, before we consider significant density in car dependent locations, we must await further meaningful investment in transit, a completion of the on, I'll, I'll 
use my remaining two minutes, completion of the ongoing interchange program project, uh, a better understanding of the likely transportation impacts of developments already in progress and developments likely to occur on the nearby lands of the Slaywood Tooth Nation over which we're likely to have very little um, input. If we are to create this level of density, I believe we ought to do so nearer to transit hubs and nearer to town centers. Let us be clear, this proposal calls for a tripling of density in a car dependent location. In my view, this is neither good community planning nor good climate policy. While I respect the efforts to make the proposal climate friendly, adding hundreds of cars to this location can only be bad for the environment. And I do not consist, uh, consider that to be consistent uh, with the declaration that we have made regarding a climate emergency. I also note with disappointment, the lack of including a childcare amenity in this uh, proposal. I appreciate that public sentiment is mixed with respect to this proposal. I respect and thank everyone who came out to speak both for and against. I understand that aspects of the proposal are attractive uh, and that I respect those who spoke in support of those aspects, such as the rent to own, the rental, the car share proposal, the affordable rental and the zero fossil fuel. But I must consider the totality of the proposal and consider whether this level of density on this site is in the best interest of the community and broadly supported. And for those reasons stated, I do not believe this to be the case. And I do not believe this proposal ought to receive second and third readings at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Kern. Thank you. Um, so try not to repeat what uh, others have said. Um, no one has really mentioned the rent to own. So I just wanted to touch on that. Um, there are 119 apartments proposed with 25 of them rent to own and over 600 um, folks have expressed interest in that. And I've personally heard from um, folks in our community that um, that is something they're, they're quite excited about. Um, the Habitat for Humanity um, project would, I believe, and, and Stephanie Baker can correct me if I'm wrong, would be the first um, that's fossil fuel free. So I think that that's an opportunity to build um, capacity there. Um, I am most excited about the rental units um, because the um, if you look east of Seymour and you look over time, I mean, I know in Deep Cove we have, uh, I think, 48. Um, purpose-built rentals that are from maybe the 60s, Honey's Donuts buildings above there. I think they were built um, about in the 60s. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, but then Blue Ridge Apartments, as Councillor Bond ha um, has mentioned, um, I think were built uh, when we landed on the moon. Um, and um, so it's it's been a long time. So I do, um, I am excited about that because um, working in retail and working in climate. I work with a lot of young folks and that's the type of housing um, that they really want. They don't like living um, there. They don't really want to live in basements. They want to live in um, secured rental units. Uh, the partnership with Hollyburn is um, really exciting at this point. It's not uh, confirmed. So I think that's something that we would be looking to Susie Chant who presented earlier to help us um, advocate for those um, units to potentially even be more affordable, although as Councillor Bond pointed out, I think that they do have um, uh, provide a level of affordability um, as they are. So I, I just generally wanted to talk about sort of the housing mix. Um, going back in time for a second, how much time do I have? I should have set a timer. Uh, minute 50 left on your four minutes. What does that mean? How fast should I talk now? Um, okay. So um, transportation, I think, is this, we talk about transportation all the time. Um, we collectively, as a society, have to rethink and reimagine mobility. Um, no one likes traffic and no one likes pollution. Clean air should absolutely be a human right. Over 7 million people die a year from the, the impacts of air pollution. Um, we need the most convenient option to move to also be the most sustainable and affordable and accessible option, and that's not the way it is. So to look at a proposal like this is to look is to believe in a better future and I absolutely do 
Um, and so I, I think that we have to look at the region. There is over, uh, this is old data because that's what Metro has currently, um, 1.4 million vehicles in this region emitting four and a half million tons of carbon annually. Like we can't achieve our goals, which we will achieve. This is not optional. Um, we have to change mobility. So I see the underground parking um, that I don't support <laughs> um, uh, turning into a roller rink and a garden because we're eventually not going to need them. But I, I concede that <laughs> the developer, <laughs> we're not quite there. Um, but there are improvements to Fibs Exchange. This is a walkable um, elementary school, high school. Um, the little cafe that is operating there could work um, also as a zero waste little market that could be run by Hollyburn. Um, I appreciate the work that um, there's another coffee shop in the neighborhood. There's a convenience store across the way. Those 500 plus vehicles are not, um, they're already in the region most likely, um, and they're not causing harm if they're moving. And so our job as policymakers is to make them not have to move because we provide alternatives. Um, there is a wide road allowance on Mount Seymour Parkway. There is room for cycling infrastructure. Um, I think all of these changes that we need are not about technology, they're about leadership. So um, I just wanted to talk a bit about that. The zero um, operating carbon development is something that I think we should all be um, excited about in the sense that it is avoiding costly retrofits. It's building capacity for the industry and trades. One of the things that I have done is try to identify the barriers that prevent us from doing what we said we're going to do, um, which is to reduce our carbon pollution. Um, this also builds knowledge for our staff and um, it demonstrates leadership. Uh, so I will support this. Um, th this. At this point, it's for the rezoning. There are, this isn't the development permit, this is the rezoning permit. Um, when I look at the neighborhood and I look at um, what's happened over time and where we need to go, I think this gets us closer to that community um, that we need to get to in a short period of time. Um, but I, I am still gonna push the applicant um, on the way that this is built and looking at the life cycle impacts, because as I mentioned before, we're not even looking at the embodied energy and carbon that goes into this. This building, these 114 homes that Mayor Little, you have talked about and other people have talked about, their asbestos got transported to Alberta. Like it's all still here. So we have to be thinking about the end of the building's life at the beginning. Um, and we have to be looking at all of the impacts of um, construction. So I actually, um, think that this is an opportunity also for Anthem, which according to their website, how much time do I have, Mary Little? 30 seconds? Oh. Okay, um, $6 billion in combined project value. Like I'm calling on them to do better. Um, we need them to do more. We need all of um, industry to come together and we will partner with people that are going to get us closer um, to where we need to go. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'll support this. And, but I'm not going away. I think that the community might feel like we support something and then we go away. I absolutely agree. We need childcare. We need transportation improvement. Um, but I think that we can do that by working together. So um, I'm willing to do that. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Um, for my own comments on this, uh, you know, I had an open mind going into the uh, public hearing. Uh, I. I was very interested to hear the community comment. I did feel that there was overwhelming support both locally and uh, there were a number of participants that were operating more regionally. Um, but uh, uh, I definitely heard a lot of positive support uh, from the local community as this process has gone on. Um, you know, the way I view this space is, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned it at first reading, my, my, uh, my parents when they first moved back from university uh, this was where they lived. And uh, this was uh, as a young couple on a limited income uh, with uh, twin girls uh, at the time, they, uh, um, they could still afford it. Uh, and so this has performed a role for the Seymour community for a very long period of time. And so in the renewal of this, this property, it was critically important for this to have a significant component of affordability, which I think it, it has. Um, I, Again, would love to, I, I, I lament that uh, at this 
time. Uh, it is not economically feasible with land values the way they are. I mean, District North Vancouver were unzoned. Let's just talk about single family zoned properties are sitting around uh, $6 million an acre for the District of North Vancouver. And so uh, the, the feasibility of having what was there, but built as new, I understand is not, is not possible. You could not have that much uh, common green space in there and uh, and still make it work and uh, so I but I don't uh, I, I, I do think that a lot of the uh, features that they have included in the project are positive um, I think that the uh, uh, the site itself uh, has performed the affordability role for a very long period of time it's over the fence from a high school it's across the street from a community center it is down the road from both a dance hall and from a from a a, a daycare space that is already um, in the neighborhood. Uh, and it also has um, uh, some home-based daycare across the street uh, to the north as well. Uh, I think that the site is served by three buses, if I'm not mistaken, the, 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 the old C-15, which I think is the 215 now, the 211, and then the Blue Ridge one comes down uh, right at the corner of Berkeley, so it's only a block away from the site. So it has fairly good uh, transit service. It's a brownfield site. Uh, the uh, uh, again, you know, it's it's. If I was going to be envisioning where we would put higher density, lower cost options into the Seymour area, this is where I'd put it. This is where it's always been. This is since the 1970s when my parents lived there. It's it's been the low cost, low cost affordable housing for for the community. Um, so. I'm, uh, I'm going to be supportive of it after hearing the community's concerns. I think that it is uh, uh, still generally a good fit within the community, uh, a little more dense than, than I would have liked, but this is what we have to do in order to be able to get some of those achievables. Uh, I look forward to seeing what we can place in the uh, commercial space that's there, uh, but, um, uh, and I, I do want to um, certainly recognize the concerns that some of the community has had about construction traffic management in this space. Uh, you have a high school that, well, during the pandemic, it's on some fairly strange schedules, but uh, two years from now, when this is expected to commence construction, uh, we'll probably be back to a fairly typical pattern, which uh, I think means that this street is going to be extremely busy with young people going through. So con construction traffic management will be uh, uh, something we have to watch closely. Uh, but uh, I, I think there's a lot of good in this in this uh, development, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing this project move forward. I have no further speakers from council, so um, I think typically um, council reports. I don't recall hearing from you. If you want to make comments, now is the time. But if uh, if you're happy that your comments have been concerns have been addressed, uh, council reports. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have to say that this is probably one of the most difficult decisions that I think I've had to weigh back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. Um, I, uh, I try to listen to the community and what the community wants. Um, and there, and I understand um, because I hear from people out on out in Seymour about the uh, traffic problems and traffic issues and and in some areas the parking issues that they have so I I, I, I acknowledge that and and I understand some of what they're dealing with um, I think the 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 other issue though, is that we have to think about um, not just Seymour because land is getting a little bit more scarce as far as what we can build on or service easily uh, at the moment anyway. Um, and so we have to consider the kind of uh, uh, developments that are going in in general because that's what we're elected for in general in the totality of the district. And um, I'm not sure that you could put this, this kind of, um, I'm thinking of all the different town centers right now, and I'm not sure that there's much space left in them to put in this 
large at development. Um, I'm sure there is one or two, but it's, we can't keep saying what belongs in a town center because our town centers are getting full. They're getting developed and they're getting full as well. It's not to say that we can't put more into them. We certainly can. Um, I'm disappointed again at the uh, amount of affordable units in here. Um, Cause I do think it's mainly a strata rental issue, but I also think that the developer has gone out of their way to put some win-wins in here. Um, I think the uh, car share, the uh, 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 the moto transportation, the charging stations for electrified vehicles, um, I th and the commercial, small commercial space that's there. Um, They've done a number of things that uh, are win-wins, but there are still a few things that are negatives for me. So I've had a really hard time coming to my decision on this one. <laughs> I'm still having a hard time. Does anybody else want to talk twice? <laughs> um, I think on the whole, uh, we need rental housing. And... I don't like that this development has as many units on it as it has. I don't like the location particularly because it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of traffic and pedestrian traffic um, with Windsor School being right there. I don't like all of that, but on a, as a whole in the district, we need rental housing. Um, I wish it was more uh, affordable rental and maybe some social in there, but it's a private developer. So we can't dictate um, all of what we want with a private developer. It's not our land. Um, I think that we can't freeze at the, the limit of rental housing we have now. We are constantly getting um, People here who are wanting to downsize, children who are growing up that are looking how to stay into in the neighborhood. And we're also getting people coming from other places. So as much as this, this, this doesn't give me all that I really would want in a unit, I'd like less market involved in this and maybe a little less density and a little less parking. And I think council has to, and I, I commit to staying with this, that I will stay on top of trying to do something about infrastructure around Seymour, uh, whether that involves something down on Dollarton or something on Seymour Parkway, I'm not sure, but I mean, I will stay on top with that. That's a priority for me. And because I realize this is gonna affect that. I also think the bridge, all the construction for the bridge will be finished uh, by the time this, this starts uh, being developed and it will be developed in phases. Um, so I'm hopeful that we will have some better transportation solutions uh, and some of the new highway construction will help us out with that. That being said, I would have to say that because it's providing more housing for people who want to stay here, um, then I'm in favor of this development. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Forbes. Uh, Council, I see no further uh, hands at this time. So I'm gonna call the question on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 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 Okay, so Mr. Can we clarify that your worship? I have Councillor Hanson. I think I heard Councillor Mary in there. I'm nay. Yes, that's correct. And then so, uh, two opposed. Uh, and five in favor. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That matches my number. Okay. Uh, and thank you very much. Your Sorry. worship, I should just mention it's uh, 1027. If the meeting's to carry on, we'll need a resolution to go beyond 1030. Move adjournment. <laughs> uh, I, that's that's actually fair at this point. I think uh, we haven't uh, we were going to leave some time for reports tonight. We didn't really get to that, um, and frankly, we have a meeting next Monday. And most of us have not been meeting with our, our committees over the Christmas break, so uh, that's fair. But I think we can uh, we can go straight to an adjournment uh, then. So, Councillor Murray has uh, moved adjournment. 
Uh, I will uh, second that. I'll call a question, all those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you all very much for your participation this evening and uh, have a great week and uh, we'll see you next Monday. Good night.